Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a big pleasure to welcome you to this online conference on humanities and social sciences for sustainability. I'm pleased to welcome you all as viewers, as speakers, but also as partners of the discussion of the presentations. And I'm also very pleased to welcome representatives of many of the most important institutions and organizations in the field of sustainability, like UNESCO, the Club of Rome, the Academy, World Academy of Arts and Science, the European Science Academy, and also the International Council for Philosophy and the Human Sciences, as well as the Europe International Geographical Union. All these are, at least over the last half century, engaged in scientific cooperation, and most of them also in sustainability research and policies. But first of all, I would like to introduce to you to my colleagues sitting next to me. Uh, Hartmut Rosa that is the director of the Max Weber College of the University of Erfurt and professor of sociology at the Friedrich Schiller University of Jena. As one of the most cited German-speaking sociologists of the present and a public intellectual, Hartmut is worldwide known for his work on social acceleration and resonance, a topic he will address later this, uh, on this afternoon. Tiago de Oliveira Pinto, originally from Brazil and still working at the University of Sao Paulo, is the holder of the UNESCO Chair on Transcultural Music Studies at the Franz Liszt University, Weimar. Among many other things, he is the member of the Expert Committee of, for Intentional Cultural Heritage of the German UNESCO Commission, a topic he is addressing in his presentation later today. And last but not least, uh, Thomas Reuter. He's a professor of anthropology and Asian studies at the University of Melbourne, currently staying in Germany. Thomas was the chair of the World Council of Anthropological Associations and is a member of board of the future Earth Regional Center of Asia, as well as trustee of the World Academy of Arts and Science. And all four of us are members of the European Academy of Science. Originally, it was planned to have a much bigger group on-site participants. But I'm very pleased that we are still a group of, from the regional and national context, despite the severe traveling restrictions in Europe in the present pandemic constellation. With the present pandemic constellation, it becomes obvious how much a stronger engagement and the recognition of the humanities and the social sciences is needed for all aspects of sustainability research and policies. This constellation makes core features of all dimensions of cultural realities and social life visible. Among many other things, it becomes obvious how central face-to-face -face situations are for our everyday lives despite all tools to overcome spatial distance in real time. But even more importantly, we can recognize how strongly in everyday life the natural and the social cultural are integrated by daily practices to a, a one experienced reality. This finds, for instance, its expression in the central hygiene rules of keeping distance, washing hands, and wearing masks, with them, social habits and health are to be applied in an integrated way. And secondly, we can experience how radically we are with our body, part of nature. Our body becomes recognizable as an interface of the cultural, social, mental, and the physical. All in all, we can recognize that all human activities are culturally, socially, and naturally embedded and therefore locally situated and regionally contextualized. Another important characteristic of this truly dreadful pandemic is its global scale and the never before experienced speed of spread. It can be experienced as the dark side of the ongoing globalization processes. At the same time, this new situation makes obvious 
how important it has become to develop an understanding of our own ways of living in a global perspective, to develop a global understanding. Taken seriously, this has become a new element of the human condition in present times. This admittedly is a much shortened representation of the current pandemic shows in an impressive way how much all forms of everyday life occur in an integrated and regionally contextualized way. And by no means, according to the division of scientific labor in silos of specialized knowledge. This is an important hint that the current claims of science and the form of its organization may not only be part of the solution, but also part of the problem. As trivial the observation of everyday realities as social, culturally, and regionally differentiated ways realms may be, it has strong implications. It has strong implications for all forms of application of scientific knowledge in the broadest sense, encompassing its branches from the humanities to the social and natural sciences and engineering. What applies to the pandemic will also be relevant to all other current global challenges like growing social inequalities, hunger, climate change, loss of biodiversity, etc. And in addition, all this is not only calling for political action, but also very much for the revision of scientific institutions. The challenges for scientific realm goes far beyond a simple optimization of established scientific and educational strategies. The current challenges cannot only be addressed within the established framework of scientific division of labor. It is a task for which we must put our understanding of science and science-society relations to the test. To pass this test, any approach has first of all to reach the agents of deep social transformations, and that are the everyday actors with their routines and habits. These are the keys for change. And to do this, a global perspective is needed. It shall be a perspective that allows to respect the encompassing manifoldness of lived cultural and to take into consideration regional particularities of, social, of the social cultural as well as the natural conditions. Today's dominant approaches to tackle sustainability problems usually start from the problematic constellation in the natural world, and then lose sight for the highly differentiated causes of the supposedly natural and or so-called eco ecological problems. Because, as we know, most of the current ecological problems are man-made. They can only be understood and tackled efficiently if the cultural, social and regional embeddedness of everyday human activities is taken systematically into account. Keeping in mind that probably all of the pressing global challenges are based on mostly unintended consequences of human actions, we need to apply the strategies of solution to the strategies of the problem production. Applied to the so-called climate policy, this is asking to, tr to transform it actually to human policy or more precisely, to action policy. And such policy consequently requires expertise of the humanities and the social sciences. If sustainability programs are to bring about a lasting change of problematic actions, the actors must also be con convinced of the benefits of the required change for themselves. And such an, a turn from climate to action and its consequences for the actor itself would make this vision of self-benefit more accessible. In order to win the majority of for new or modified forms of lifestyle, it is also necessary, and this is the second and perhaps decisive condition, the actors understand how their own lives are embedded in global contexts, both social, cultural, and 
natural. A first condition to this is to take the cultural context of all individuals serious and to address them in socially and regionally differentiated ways. I mentioned a few minutes ago that our everyday actions are culturally and socially, but also regionally embedded. This also corresponds to our everyday experience. Small and supposedly insignificant decisions like what we eat, how we eat, how we deal with waste and so on, only seem to have local effects. However, globally aggregated, their effects can be quite considerable. One could even say that there are only few everyday practices that are exclusively local. One of the tasks of integrated applied research could certainly be to take these interconnections visible for different cultural contexts. The proposed change in perspective towards a differentiated view seems to have further advantages. The dominant top-down strategies in sustainable polities include one-size-fits-all or solution for one solution for all strategies. If one accepts such directions to proceed, one must, must also accept a highly problematic cultural imperialism. The suggested turn in perspective allows to avoid this and to take global references into account while at the same time emphasizing the importance of the individual standpoint with its regional, local, cultural and social embeddedness. In the light of this consideration, it also becomes obvious that for approaching everyday real problems, real world problems, another strategy of knowledge production and mobilization is needed. A reform that just focuses the internal logic of science is not sufficient. A more radical turnaround is necessary. To overcome the disadvantages of science organizations in form of disciplinary silos of knowledge production and application, the well-established recipe is to call for interdisciplinary cooperation. But in the meantime, it has become more and more apparent that this call for interdisciplinary cooperation is, despite many advantages internal to science, overall not expected overall not ex expected as a success story. One reason for this is the most likely the fact that everyday problems definition from scientific point of view is the result of a specific disciplinary perspective. If we are calling for interdisciplinary cooperation, normally one discipline is addressing a problem and asking other disciplines to cooperate with them. That means, first of all, that the disciplines that are called for cooperation are asked to subordinate their interest to the ones that, of the key partner that identified the topics to be addressed. There is no other, other way of inter interdisciplinary cooperation. If, for instance, the interdisciplinary project is focused on river catchments, then this would be certainly a highly interesting topic for several natural scientific disciplines, but does not make so much sense for the cultural and social sciences because the definition and identification of the research project's topic is not a culturally and socially constituted, but rather a geoscientific one. Second, the ditches between science and highly diverse social, cultural, everyday worlds can be bridged just by intensification of the cooperation between disciplines. As the just mentioned example may indicate, it will be very difficult to find access to the social cultural realities if the scientific constitution is, of it is external to that world. To so this rather an orientation to the conditions of everyday world and the conclusion from the given disciplinary order to the best solution strategy is necessary. What is appropriate for the development of scientific theories is not most helpful approach of solving everyday problems for which the actors themselves are to one over. This calls to a step from, to do a step from the inter to transdisciplinarity. Instead of an analytical splitting, 
process of the mundane, a recognition of the scientific insights in the logic of everyday action is then required. In problem situation, if it's not important to know what disciplines is suggesting something, but what should be done and how it should be done. The knowledge to be mobilized should therefore be organized in a way that it can be easily inserted into action flows and followed by the actors. At the same time, this includes the change from top down to a bottom up structure of interaction between science and the everyday world. In sum, meeting the challenges of the 21st century inactively entails a vision of current modes of knowledge production and dissemination. For the advancements of scientific theories, the specialization of basic science with selective interdisciplinary cooperation is certainly the most promising way for the advancements of science in itself. But to overcome big societal challenges and foster deep societal change, a complementation of the well-established strategies has, not to be, has to be put on the agenda. In short, deep societal transformations without the humanities and social sciences knowledge are hardly feasible. If one agrees on that, the question then is how to implement this insight. That's what this conference is about, finding answer to this question. Before we now move forward to the thematic presentations, I invite you to raise your attention for the welcome addresses of the partners of this virtual conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear Professor Werlen, dear participants of the conference, I'm very pleased to open your event. The corona pandemic shows very clearly that our social system is finally balanced. In many areas of public life, of private life, we realize how strongly everything is connected, how strong everything is related to each other. Sustainability also refers to those relations and social networks and rethinks possible changes. How does our own behavior and action in daily life affect the larger context? This is what makes an intensive discussion on how to develop a sustainable future and sustainable societies so important. The answer to these questions can certainly not be provided exclusively by the science. But science can make a significant contribution to the debate and develop new visions. As the Minister for Science, I'm very pleased that Scheringen universities have committed to the two principles of interdisciplinarity and sustainability in many ways. The UNESCO chair at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena has made its tasks to explore the global understanding for sustainability and while doing so refers not only to the natural and life sciences, but also on the human and social science. We are really proud of having that institute here in Jena. So the issue of sustainability is in best hands within Thuringia as a science location. The importance of sustainable development is reflected at all levels of the state's research funding. Sustainability is defined as one major objective of research in the relevant EU funding lines to support research and innovation, as well as the support programs of the federal ministries and the Free State of Thuringia. Therefore, Scientists who aim at more sustainability have our full encouragement here in Thuringia. This includes this important conference today, which I really support and appreciate. I wish you 
a successful event with constructive discussions, with new impulses for sustainability research, and towards closer cooperation among all those working on that important topic, including the various civil society actors. Best regards from Thuringia. Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the MNTs and Social Sciences for Sustainability Conference. My name is Leah Bassa. I'm talking to you from Canada, where I am president of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. More precisely, I live in St. Catharines, Ontario, on the traditional ter territory of the Otsuni and Anishinaabe peoples, an area that is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. As you may know, the goal of the UNESCO the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization is to build peace through international cooperation. It works towards the goal through an initiative in education, human, social and natural sciences and cultural communication and information. The Canadian Commission for UNESCO carries out UNESCO's mandate in Canada. I'm also a, the UNESCO chair on community sustainability from local to global at Brock University. The UNESCO chair net network has more than 700 members in 116 different countries. We work to create shared space for dialogue and on capacity building through knowledge exchange. My chair is in both the faculty of math and science and the faculty of social sciences as my research is interdisciplinary. I bridge these different discipline by building partnerships for change where all ways of knowing are respected and valued. But what do I mean by all ways of knowing? I'm talking about an approach to sustainability that is holistic, that draws not only on the natural sciences, but on the humanities and social sciences and the, the, that embrace cultural practices and indigenous local and traditional knowledge. For example, while it's still important to hear from North American and European scientists, we now recognize that it's just as important to hear from Asian artists, African humanities specialists, or Latin American biologists. To achieve sustainability, we must understand and respect both the natural and the human sciences and include perspective from all over the place. But it's not enough to be multidisciplinary we must push toward transdisciplinarity, a place where sustainability projects are not only done for communities, but with communities and by communities. This evolving approach decolonizes a knowledge and ensure that the people in need of solution are also at the forefront of the research and action towards a better world. It recognizes the importance of diverse worldviews and of the connection between nature and people to ensure respects for all the components of the world, not just the economy. Knowledge mobilization is an important piece of this movement because it aims to bridge the divide between creating new knowledge and using it for social good. It's not a new concept, but it seems more important than ever in face of COVID-19 and multiple other crises that we're currently facing. In fact, it's at the heart of our efforts to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goal. Over the next two days, the conference will shine a spotlight on some fascinating new ideas about how we can best use humanities and social science research to move the world towards greater sustainability. Welcome to the conference. I hope you enjoy the presentation and gather valuable insight from them. Thank you for listening. Dear honorary guests, dear conference participants, dear interested online viewers, dear Professor Werden. We have 10 years left to implement the 2030 Agenda, 10 years for a global transformation to sustainability, 10 years which the UN has declared the decade of action. The climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity and global wealth inequality, these are some of the huge challenges that require us to urgently move towards sustainability and the implementation of the 17 SDGs. 
This conference starts from the observation that it is the natural sciences and engineering that currently mostly shape scientific policy advice on sustainability policy worldwide. Just to highlight the fact that this is not sufficient when it comes to transformation processes. We need to create acceptance for change and transformation in our societies worldwide. Transformation to sustainability starts with our everyday practices. This is a permanent task of balancing our needs, making compromises, changing cultural habits, our identity and lifestyle. This is the field of the humanities and the social sciences. Small communities and societies all over the world, sometimes well interlinked, drive for the process of understanding and accepting the urgency of acting in favor of sustainability. This makes change and sustainability policy successful. UNESCO has established dozens of global networks of such pioneers of the sustainability discourse and of sustainable practices. There are places such as biosphere reserves and geoparks, there are school networks, even city networks, and networks of scientists such as the UNESCO chairs. We are proud to count Professor Verlin among the UNESCO chairs in Germany. Professor Verlin, you are a researcher who is not only working on a specific sustainability issue, but exactly on the question of how to enable knowledge processes and cultural processes across temporal and spatial scales that promote sustainability. While the 14 UNESCO chairs in Germany represent a wide variety of scientific fields, they have agreed upon a joint unique profile. They understand themselves as academic institutions that combine strong north-south partnerships with a deliberate inter- and transdisciplinary approach, all in order to support the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. This conference itself is an excellent example of multilateral and transdisciplinary cooperation. It not only brings together excellent researchers from all over the world, but includes also stakeholders from outside academia and civil society. The conference links well to UNESCO initiatives such as the 2017 UNESCO Sustainability Science Guidelines, to which the German Commission for UNESCO has contributed substantially, the UNESCO MOST program in the social science and the humanities, and in particular, the New Bridges sub-program. It also links very well to initiatives by the global science organizations, such as the International Science Council and CIPSH, to those of global networks of academies, and of course, to the framework of the follow-up of the International Year of Global Understanding, for which Professor Verlin has invested so much of his lifetime. I'm convinced that this conference is exactly the way that drives us forward. The Agenda 2030 as a multilateral process of creating commitment and real change. We need all partners, science and research institutions, as well as stakeholders from the economy, civil society and political decision makers. I wish you all a very fruitful and inspiring conference. Thank you for your attention. Dear conference participants, as outgoing dean of the Faculty of Chemistry and Earth Sciences of Friedrich Schiller University, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Conference on Humanities and Social Sciences for Sustainability. I do this also on behalf of the president of our university, who sends his best wishes for a successful event. I'm delighted with a great number of outstanding national and international speakers and guests at this conference. Sustainability, ecology, and the need to integrate disciplinary perspectives are notions that are all closely linked to our university, both historically and at present. In fact, the very idea of sustainability originated in the early 18th century work of Hans Karl von Karlowitz, who had studied law in Jena. Karlowitz highlighted the, the idea that only as much wood should be cut as could be regrown in a forest. Later in 1866, Ernst Heckel, a professor of zoology at the University of Jena, coined the term ecology and thus promoted a holistic understanding of the interactions between organisms and their habitat. 
Moreover, as Schiller, Goethe, and Alexander and Wilhelm von Humboldt meet in Jena in the late 18th century, the early Romanticist movement strived to combine perspectives of the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences, and art to better understand the world around us and our place within it. Today, we realize that such integrated perspectives are urgently needed, perhaps more than ever before, to solve the challenging issues of our times. Even in times of the COVID-19 pandemic, we must realize that global climatic and environmental changes with all their related social issues are among the most pressing problems and they require global, multilateral and multidisciplinary approaches. These issues will accompany us not only for years, but for the decades and centuries to come. It is in this context that the UNESCO Chair on Global Understanding for Sustainability was established in 2018 by Professor Verlin. As outgoing Dean and as a colleague in the Department of Geography, I am very glad and excited that this professorship is part of our faculty. This chair and its achievements also remind us of the outstanding role of geography as the subject that combines natural and social sciences as well as humanities in order to address these urgent issues. Professor Valen's professorship is part of a vibrant geography department that covers all major fields from geomatics to environmental sciences, urban and regional development, and geography education. Its eight professors participate in numerous competitive initiatives, including a collaborative research center, Aquadiva, and the Leibniz Science Campus, Eastern Europe Global Area. They collaborate closely with partners in the region, such as the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry or the Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography, contributing to sustainability science from multiple viewpoints. Before closing my introductory note, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Verlen as the conference chair, as well as the many committed sponsors and helpers for making this event possible. Through the conference website, I hope you will also have the time to explore the beautiful landscape of the Saale Valley around Jena. And I very much hope to be able to welcome you in Jena um, in person on a different occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very fruitful and inspiring time at this conference. It gives me great pleasure as president of the International Geographical Union uh, to welcome you all to this uh, important conference on the humanities and social sciences for sustainability. I know that uh, on all our minds at the moment is the COVID-19 crisis that has affected uh, really every single one of us uh, in every country of the planet in, in one way or another. And as important uh, as it is to address that uh, crisis at the moment, in a sense, it pales into insignificance uh, in relation to the environmental crisis, which, to be perfectly honest, threatens the very survival of our species as a whole in ways that uh, COVID-19 uh, doesn't for all its impacts upon us in terms of health and the economy. So I think it's vital then that we find ways uh, to work together, particularly across those traditional disciplinary boundaries uh, in order to address what I think is the most fundamental crisis of all. Geography, actually, I think is, uh, is central to all of this. Some have said that it is, in a sense, the science of uh, sustainability. The IGU is... Uh, recognizes that because we sit at the nexus of the social, the natural sciences and the humanities and indeed the arts, that uh, the IGU is therefore a member of, it's one of the very few unions that is a member of not only the International Science Council, but also the International Council for Philosophy and uh, Human Sciences. One of our key projects in recent years has been the International Year of global understanding, the IYGU, which is now looked after by our Commission on Global Understanding. 
basic principle of the IYGU is uh, really about a bottom-up approach that uh, everyday actions by everyday people, as small as they and insignificant as they may seem, are really central, uh, ultimately vital, to addressing this issue of a more sustainable future. This conference really builds uh, very well on those IYGU uh, principles and has brought together uh, a truly stellar array of uh, scientists, uh, policymakers, of visionaries really, to uh, try to think of ways that we can bring these uh, social sciences, the humanities together with the sciences in the context of education to address what are really the fundamental challenges of the world uh, going forward. We hope maybe to uh, enable us to achieve those uh, sustainable development goals. I wish you all very well uh, in your deliberations. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to deliver a welcome speech on behalf of SIPSH, the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences. Let me first congratulate on the opening of this conference under the title of Humanities and Social Sciences for Sustainability, with specific emphasis on the cultural and the regional dimensions. The conference is sponsored by the UNESCO Chair on Global Understanding for Sustainability which was proposed and put on the UNESCO agenda by SIPSH years ago. This collaborative mechanism has made great contributions to deal with critical world concerns in many ways. I am glad to see that the present conference is a continuation of the program of the International Year of Global Understanding, a program with close cooperation with SIPSH that is going on now for almost a decade. I should say that the International Year of Global Understanding, initiated and coordinated by Professor Wallen in the name of the International Geographical Union, has been a model of the combination of ideas and actions. Let me quote a few sentences from the Declaration of Macau Portugal, issued by SIPSH on 3rd of July 2019. The diverse knowledge of vital importance to all has or should have implications for human action. The humanities provide the platform, lever and advocacy necessary for the knowledge and understanding elicited by the humanities to be translated into programs for the benefit and improvement of the human condition, as with the International Year of Global Understanding. Through joining hands with the International Year of Global Understanding, we have learned more and admired more about the international geographical communities, and we were all aware that to stay close became our mutual aspiration. Consequently, the International Geographical Union has become a member organization of SIPSH. The main idea of this conference is to discuss strategies to strengthen the social sciences and the humanities in sustainability research with the effort to explore new ways to integrate different methodologies and technical rules in the future Broader cooperation from different disciplines will certainly play an increasingly important role in promoting global sustainable development and beyond, as well as in addressing issues of global concerns and challenges. The European Humanities Conference in Lisbon is around the corner to unite more scholarly communities in responding to global challenges would be our common anticipation. I wish this conference a great success. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Gary Jacobs, President of the World Academy of Art and Science. And I welcome you 
to the International Conference on Humanities and Social Sciences for Sustainability. Greetings to our fellow Benno Werlin and our collaborating partners from UNESCO Club of Rome, ISC, CIPSH, and Academy Europa. Today, we already possess the essential knowledge in the natural sciences to understand the problems that endanger the planet, which are undermined by human behavior. We already possess the scientific and technological capabilities to address most of those problems effectively. Yet we struggle with problems such as the destruction of our planet's biodiversity, the breakdown of food chains, the depletion of natural resources, pollution, and of course the existential threat of climate change, which moves inexorably along. The knowledge we need is primarily a knowledge of social processes, of how to change our human behavior and our society, of how to convert the long, slow trial and error processes of social evolution into a rapid process of conscious social transformation. It requires that we change the way we think, the decisions we make, the way we organize our lives and act. It's primarily solutions that lie in the domain of social sciences and humanities. We have to understand ourselves. And this is the work of primary importance to the World Academy today, and therefore I'm delighted to be here to work with you, to learn from you, and participate in this process of discovery on how do we use the knowledge of humanities and social sciences to promote sustainability for ourselves and our planet. Thank you. I'm Mampila Rampili, the co-president of the Club of Rome. Thank you for inviting me to this historic conference. Let me add my word of welcome to this historic conference that enables us to focus on an element that has been missing in global academic discourse putting the human element at the center of scholarship. Aurelio Piché, the founder of the Club of Rome, expressed his regrets that this human element was neglected in the work of the Club of Rome. He even suggested that our failure to transform the way we live despite knowledge and analysis of the emergencies that our current lifestyle were bringing upon the world, we continue to live as if we have not got that scientific knowledge. The human element is critical to the possibility of emerging from these emergencies with a knowledge base, a way of teaching, of learning, and of being, so that we can be a people that are responsible for handing over this beautiful planet to our children and our children's children. I welcome the collaboration between the Club of Rome and the UN system and all the partners. Together, we can make a difference. And I thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, all the speakers of the most relevant partners of uh, this conference for their very inspiring uh, welcome addresses. Um, now we have uh, a break of uh, 15 minutes before we start then uh, with the next session, topic of the first thematic session on focus on the cultural and regional dimension of global sustainability. See you in a minute. Thank you very much. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the first thematic session of this conference. Uh, it's the topic of this session is 
focus on the cultural and regional dimension of global sustainability. I welcome the three speakers. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Rampile from South Africa. She's the co-president of the Club of Rome. Before that, she was a political activist uh, in South Africa, together with Nelson Mandela and Stephen Biko, uh, in the liberation process, uh, uh, very successful liberation process, as we all know. And she is a, a social thinker, a professional medical doctor, and many, many other things, with a big insight in many aspects of our world. The second speaker will be Jerry Jacobs, we already saw, uh, as well as a welcome address. He is the president and CEO of the World Academy of Art and Science and, uh, and uh, many other things as well, um, and very much engaged in the interface of UN system and s social uh, policy, sustainability policy and scientific approaches. And last but not least, uh, uh, Professor van der Löw, uh, he's a pioneer in the field of bringing the social sciences in into the um, uh, sustainability policies and he is also the founding director of the Arizona State University School for Human Evolution and Social Change. I welcome all three of you and wish you uh, all of your viewers an interesting proposition, uh, presentation of these uh, three topics they just will present. Thank you very much. After that, we have a discussion, and I invite you to raise the question through the YouTube channel, and I will address them to our speakers after in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to this very important conference. I would like to share with you a, an approach to humanities reimagined. The post-COVID world offers us an opportunity to dare to reimagine our approaches to our established way of life and long-held traditions about scholarship and the values that drive our social, economic, and political engagements. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you the reimagining work the Club of Rome Africa chapter is doing to ensure that we can add value to the thematic work of the Club of Rome to promote a focus on how the global community can emerge from the multiple emergencies we have brought upon ourselves. I would like to explore three themes. How do we bring the specific lens of Africa to bear on what has been framed as universal towards a more pluriversal approach? How do we bring back into focus the values of Mother Africa, of Ubuntu, Omenala, Ukama, to reframe a more appropriate value system for a new emerging civilization? Third, how do we build on the successes of Africa to promote greater engagement of its youthful population and the diaspora to reimagine and rebuild Africa and thereby help give the world a more human face? Let's start with new narratives from an African lens. Our objective is to apply transgenerational insights and wisdom to approach the most pressing global problems in an integration, in an integrated and sustainable way, extending beyond our local context to be applied globally. Our proposition to take up a decolonial lens is to unfurl African thought as a resource for Writing way back on the morrow of a colonial age, Amy Cesare predicted the future when he wrote, a civilization that proves incapable 
of solving the problems it creates is a decadent civilization. A civilization that chooses to close its eyes to its most crucial problems is a stricken civilization. The Club of Rome Planetary Emergency Plan, entitled Securing a New Deal for People, Nature and Climate, may well be the most far-sighted and urgent call for the stricken civilization to open its eyes. The Club of Rome Planetary Emergency Plan, entitled Securing a New Deal for People, Nature and Climate, may well be the most clear-sighted and urgent call for this stricken civilization to open its eyes. But like so many documents of this nature, the epistemic nature and center remains Euro-American. When we Africans write from where we are and not through the eyes of those who look at us, our epistemic center changes. This is what Kajeni refers to as the decolonial term. By starting from the assumption that coloniality is the core challenge in the world today, the decolonial perspective swaps the Euro-American definition of universality with a diverse pluriversality where the Euro-American epistemic center is no longer assumed to be the norm. In the words of Kageni, I quote, what the epistemological struggle should seek to achieve is cognitive justice, which would enable everyone to benefit from ecologies of knowledge while enriching humanity. The horizon that is sought is pluriversality rather than universality because the latter is predicated on the Euro-American hegemonic drive that results in inequality rather than equality. The epistemological struggle lies at the base of the reimagination of another world not founded on racism. What continues to inhibit African creativity, innovation, imagination is epistemological colonization that dates back to the time of colonial encounters. A new struggle pitched at the epistemological level and underpinned by a colonial, a decolonial epistemic perspective not only reveals the truth about the continuation of colonialism, but also entails the decolonization of the minds of African people. Without mental decolonization, it is impossible to imagine another world. The decolonial perspective may well reveal more clearly what is planetary about the planetary emergency plan. In practice, as argued by Kageni, this will entail three epistemic breaks. The first is to break from what Franz Fanon called nauseating mimicry, namely the tendency within Africa to assume that solutions developed elsewhere are superior to those developed in Africa. Second is the break from the assumption that 19th century social and economic sciences are adequate to addressing 21st century challenges. This means unthinking long-held paradigms and assumptions and then rethinking in context about appropriate solutions in ways that are decoupled from outdated paradigms. The third break is about ending the love affair with a particular conception of modernity, which has resulted in a search for liberation and development within epistemic parameters established at the start of the colonial era. The decolonial turn is about accepting that the former colony, in this case, Africa, as both a place and epistemic challenge, not only has a voice, but constitutes a context conducive to generating solutions that might be difficult to see
from a Euro-American epistemic center. To this extent, decoloniality may be a precondition to true planetary solutions. Exploring new visions of the world through the epistemological uh, center of being in place implies a leaving behind of old orders, as suggested by Gagin. A certain world ending happens when we are reorienting ourselves and often such shifts produces fugitives, people who are no longer at home and on the way to the place they remember as home. West African philosopher and poet Bayo Agomo Lafi reminds us that the thing to do when this happens is not to try to kickstart a fresh new order of being, try to quickly imagine the next or rush into manifestos. The thing to do is to consult the corrosive agency of greater intelligences, seek to be defeated and shape shifted by these others. We must meet at crossroads and stir an alchemy of dissent which might allow us to build new coalitions of becoming in response to the world around. So what about a value system for emergence from emergence? Cornell West, a Harvard University professor, reminds us that three anchors of the new value system are needed for emergence from self-imposed emergencies. Remembering, reverence, and resurrection. So in the process of transitioning from old to new orders, Africa offers not a new world order, but a place from where we all can engage in the process of remembering what it means to be human. That is grounded in a relational, in ethical imperative of becoming with others. Drawing from the well of generosity and solidarity within us, we are invited to forge new coalitions of becoming by remembering the African conception of what it means to be human, through which a new African humanness can be evolved. This form of remembrance does not draw on a superficial nostalgia for the pre-colonial traditions, but calls forth an even deeper view of what it means to be human in essence. Kofu, Kofi Opuku, an African scholar descendant of the Akan people in Ghana, expresses this more eloquently. This is what he says. The concept of human beingness is the essence of being human, termed Ubuntu in Bantu languages. It is central to the African cultures and religious traditions. It is the capacity in African culture to express compassion, reciprocity, dignity, harmony, and humanity in the interests of building and maintaining community. The core of African concepts such as Ubuntu is that one cannot be complete as a human being without the reciprocal affirmation of other human beings. The Akan in Ghana refers to it as it is a human being who makes another person a human being. This epistemic convergence of the sub-Saharan philosophy of relatedness and Western post-humanism makes it possible to identify and challenge the dominant values of masculinism, racism, the dogma of the superiority of scientific reason, the devaluation of indigenous knowledge, and the worship of the ever-rational individual, homo economicus. If these values remain dominant, they will prohibit the emergence of the transformed world envisaged in the planetary emergency plan. Where they can 
expressed most beautifully is via the notion of ukama, that is the multi-species rationality that is allowed to flower within eco-cultural commons. And what of reverence? Reverence means a deeply, res deeply respectful of who we are to the extent that we can reclaim our context. Once the epistemic center of the universe has been decolonized, a pluriverse of multiple centers of decolonial knowledge opens up. We celebrate a wide range of initiatives, actions, processes, reforms, innovations, and best that best express what Africa can bring to the world. Just because slavery, colonialism, and neocolonialism and structural adjustments did so much damage, this does not mean that greatness is impossible. Ben Okri put it eloquently when he said, when nations do amazing things, that is because they create from what they know. And what and that is a lot. When they do extraordinary things, that is because they create from places in themselves they didn't suspect were there. But when a nation or an individual creates things so sublime, in a sort of permanent genius of inventiveness and delight, when they create things so miraculous, that they have not even been noticed by the most remarkable brains, then that is because they create always from the vast unknown places within them. They create always from beyond. They make the undiscovered places and infinities in them their friends. They live on the invisible fields of their hidden genius. We are committed to rebuild Africa within the pluriverse inspired by the planetary emergency plan in a way that addresses the seemingly the seeming intractability of the African challenges. For this, we will need visionary knowledge of the past and present with the cultural, normative and ecological place-based practices to inform relational modes of governance that will bring the changes we are hoping for. In Africa, where futures are often predicated upon Western ideals of development, making explicit the relevance of local cultures and the importance of the past for navigating the future is critical. Imagining hopeful and novel futures together in a world defined by complexity, diversity, and uncertainty calls for creative, collaborative, and experimental approaches and transformative modes of action. Shifting from prob a problem-centric approach to an appreciative or strength-based approaches may help unlock the deeper systemic and relational potential to create transformative pathways to change. The Club of Rome Africa members are committed to actively engage in the catalytic role of promoting emergence from emergency wherever they are located professionally to ensure that the appropriate intergenerational conversations are promoted harness the energy of Africa's youthful population to reimagine and build an Africa that can help the world re-embrace a more human face. I thank you. In early 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt became president of the United States, and he faced the greatest economic and financial crisis that the country had ever been in. It was in the middle of the Great Depression. It was in the middle of the largest banking crisis that the U.S. had ever faced. 6,000 banks had closed within the previous three years. And nothing that the earlier government did in economic policy or in 
financial policy was enough to save or stop the collapse. Unemployment is at 25 percent. Foreclosures on farms and houses were at an all-time high. People were lining up at the banks to withdraw their money before the, the banks failed. And the very fact of them coming and taking it out was enough to make even the best banks fail. So his first act as president was to declare a one-week banking holiday. And on the fifth day, he got on the radio in the first of his famous fireside chats, and he said, what's wrong with America? What's happened to us? We still have all the rich natural resources, the fertile lands, the big productive factories, the talented, skilled, hardworking, dedicated American people. What's wrong with us? What have we lost? He said, we've lost our self-confidence. He said, we have famous words, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And he said, on Monday morning, I'm going to open up the banks again. And I'm going to ask you to go back to the banks follow, and stand in line as you were this week. But this time, I want you to go and redeposit your money in the bank to save the system, to save the country, because it's not up to somebody else, it's up to us. FDR's actions worked. The next week, the banking crisis subsided and stopped, and the banking system was saved. And then he introduced the New Deal programs that built up and created jobs that stimulated the economy during a long recovery period. And interestingly enough, one of the important initiatives he took was to create the Civilian Conservation Corps to not only save and make the society sustainable, but to improve the sustainability of the environment, of nature in America, created the national park system, created huge forest areas, founded the T T Tennessee Valley Authority to take uh, and, uh, and harness productively the, the, the waters of the great rivers for productive purposes. He had an integrated approach. He said nothing he had learned at Harvard, studying economics and other subjects, had prepared him for a crisis like that. He knew all the policy, he knew all the theory, he knew all the rules, but nothing prepared him to deal with a crisis of this dimension. Today, we're in a similar position. We face crises of even greater potential magnitude. The global pandemic, it's not merely or simply or even primarily a problem of biology and healthcare and hygiene. It's a social problem. It's an economic problem. It's a political problem. It's already taking our economy in many countries back to the brink of what it was in the, in the 1930s. It's already disrupting our democratic political systems, causing polarization and popularization. It's undermining the, the press. It's undermining uh, the way our democracies work. It's undermining peace and global stability and creating competitive nationalism and breaking down of alliances and relationships. It's an economic, it's a political crisis, it's a social crisis, it's a cultural crisis. Migration and is again becoming a, a critical issue. And of course, it's undermining our capacity to deal with critically important ecological issues, both in terms of our natural resources and our, bio, our wildlife, our wildlife, but also, of course, climate change. And the solution, again, it doesn't lie with the physical sciences primarily or with the biological sciences. It lies with our understanding of human beings in society. It lies with a knowledge which comes and belongs to the social sciences and humanities. And the solutions lie in changing the way we think and the way we act. And for that, our social sciences themselves need to change. We have to abandon the, the two-century-old habit or effort to try to mimic the quantitative accuracy and precision of the, quant the physical sciences 
we're not dealing here with the natural laws of nature. We're dealing with man-made, human-made laws. We're not dealing just with chance and necessity, which determines physical processes and biological evolution. We're talking about conscious choice and human values. A mechanistic approach of the physical sciences appropriate for what it deals with is not going to work. It doesn't work when we're dealing with holistic living systems, as ecology has already taught us. But the environment is not the only organic living system. Our society is too. Not only our local communities and our national society, but global society. It's a living being. It's an integrated living being. And we need the kind of knowledge, we need the kind of thinking as to how to understand that. We've got to break down the narrow disciplinary silos and try to acquire an integrated understanding of society, the way FDR did in understanding the link between economic, financial, political, social, cultural, and even ecological factors during the Great Depression. We need also something more fundamental than that, not only multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. We need a theory of change. We need to understand how to consciously initiate and accelerate the process of social change, not just by plugging in a new technology for carbon sequestration or a new vaccine for COVID. We need to understand how do we educate, how do we awaken, how do we release the energy of society, how do we mobilize people how do we influence and change attitudes and values and behaviors in a transition from a world which is not sustainable to a new civilization, a sustainable civilization, what we refer to in Club of Rome as a emerging new civilization. We need to think not only in a multidisciplinary way, but in a transdisciplinary way that understands the integrality of life and social process. And this is where the humanities and, so, and the arts can help us a lot. History, biography, and literature can offer us great insights into human processes, social processes, and how they change in an integrated way not just in piecemeal, fragmented fashion, the way we learn it in a political history or in an economic history. The cultural evolution of American society after, this, after the Civil War, in Margaret Mitchell's famous novel, Gone with the Wind, or the evolution of French society after the French Revolution in Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, or the story and history of Indians' freedom struggle or its Green Revolution, which converted a country subject to famine into one with food self-sufficiency within 10 years. And that brings us to the critical essence of social change, two things which we rarely touch on in our social scientific approach to addressing social challenges. One is the fact that unlike material nature, human beings are conscious. And our consciousness matters, our thoughts matter, our feelings matter, our attitudes matter. The subjective dimension of human reality is as important, maybe more important, than the external dimension. This is what decides what will be accomplished. And the humanities bring out something else of unique importance, and that is the importance of the individual. Because unlike in physical nature, in human nature, in human society, one person can change the world. One person like a Mahatma Gandhi can usher in the Indian freedom struggle to independence, or a man like C. Subramanyam who could single-handedly launch, conceive and launch the Green Revolution, or a Greta Thunberg at the age of 15 or 16, launching Fridays for the Future. So we need to rethink our social sciences. We need to rethink the way we think, not only in a more systematic way, but in a way that integrates the subjective 
and objective dimensions of reality in a way that recognizes the inordinate, unique role of the human individual in the changes of our society. This is the knowledge we need to build not only a sustainable planet, but a sustainable human life for all of us in the future. Thank you. Good morning. In order for you to get a better grip on what I'm trying to tell this morning, I need to say a few words to introduce myself. I am an archaeologist and a medieval historian. And as an archaeologist, I have for the last 30 years between mediating between the natural, the life, the social, and the human sciences. And so I'm sort of a hybrid, uh, more of a translator than uh, an actual disciplinary sort of person. And I have used, in order to do that, particularly uh, some of the resources developed in my early studies on the role of technologies in the past and the long-term co-evolution of people and landscapes. But in 95, subsidized by the European Union, I gave up on the archaeology. And I've actually tried to develop sustainability studies, although they weren't called that at the time, from a complex adaptive systems perspective. And I will get back to that with you in a moment. So the first lesson I think that I want to absolutely get across is that sustainability is not an environmental issue, but it is a societal issue. Societies define their environments, the challenges of those environments. And also they propose solutions for those challenges. So the initiative is completely on the society's side. Societies, as Luhmann says, do not communicate with their environment. They communicate about their environment among themselves. Now, unfortunately, most of the research done in the last 40 years has approached sustainability as an environmental challenge. And I think it is high time that the social sciences and the humanities need to take the leading role. And I will try and make that point through the rest of my talk. What is a society? A society is a shared way for a group of people to deal with their environment's dynamics. And that means that the society, the shared parts of the group, actually need to process information that is good enough to actually deal with those environmental dynamics. And if the society doesn't do that, if it cannot do that, then the society simply fails and disintegrates. So our current sustainability conundrum is that our current societal information processing about sustainability is insufficient. We are in what one could argue a crisis, which is no more or less than a temporary inadequacy of our information processing to achieve the things we need to achieve, which is sustainability. And in particular, I think, the weak point of our information processing as a society is about the bridge between gathering information and implementing policies. And we need to pay particular attention to that. And I think that is one of the reasons why I think the social sciences and the humanities need to take a leading role in what is actually happening around this area. So one thing that is part of that is that we need to know much more about the information processing that has been driving societal dynamics. It's very interesting to see that sustainability scientists, and I'm partly guilty of that, have defined environmental planetary boundaries but have never really looked at the societal planetary boundaries, which are right now emerging on the front of the stage all over the place in the sort of Black Lives Matter, but also the economics in very many different ways, the migration crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get on with it. I think one of the really important lessons can be learned from the COVID epidemic, pandemic. 
that pandemic initially seemed to hit us out of the clear blue sky. It suddenly was there. It emerged in China and it was there. But in actual fact, that is not the case. Our societies had been warned many times since 2000 by emerging ep epidemics like SARS, MERS, HN15, and all these other numbers. And so we knew that this kind of an event was going to happen. It was not a question of if, it was a question of when. And one of the interesting things that shows how we ignored that information is that here in France, where I currently am, uh, they, were, they had built up a billion and a half masks in 2010, and they destroyed all of them before 2018. They were actually destroying the very last ones when the epidemic hit. So what that means is that our information processing has blind spots. And one of the blind spots that is directly relevant to the COVID is the fact that many hundreds of thousands of pigs in the last couple of years died or were killed in China because of a swine flu, which meant that there wasn't enough meat. And part of the meat was imported, but locally and rurally, a lot of people started eating wild animals, which in China is quite normal. And that immediately linked our society to COVID. But if you want an example from a very different area, take the Royal Bank of Scotland bank run in 2009. If people had looked at the actual state of the finances of the Royal Bank of Scotland, that run could have been foreseen, but it wasn't. There was a blind spot. So the crisis is due to those kinds of blind spots, and they re require and promote a very rapid way to update the information processing of the society. The current crisis is a stress test of our information processing system. It is underadapted to the environment it has created, partly because there are so many unintended consequences of earlier actions. And it highlights fracture lines that were hidden for a long time. So what can we learn? We need to develop ex ante information processing and not only try and learn from the past. I will get back to that in a moment. We also need to create a closer link between the phenomena we observe and the contexts in which they occur. It's very interesting to see that if you present images to both the Western audience and a Chinese audience, the Chinese people will, in memory, retain the background of the image, and Westerners will retain the foreground, the subject. We have disconnected ourselves from the contextuality of many events, and that has become a problem. And that is where I think social sciences can actually do a lot. Now, that is part of the fact that what I think is completely underrated and should be regurgitated and re-emphasized in our current work is the importance of qualitative information. If you look at how we create knowledge out of observed phenomena, we do that in two stages. First, we group a number of observed phenomena together, basically limited in space and time, and begin to see which of them resemble each other sufficiently to actually be treated together. But while we do that, we preserve the multidimensionality and the poly interpretability of those groups. So we have not very much control over the content, but we have a wider content. In a second stage, what we generally do is we classify them, we reduce that multidimensionality, we narrow the interpretations, we take away a lot of what we think is noise to retain the signal, and so we get more control, but over less, a less wide range of phenomena. In our current scientific life, we live in a period that emphasizes control, and that emphasizes classes over groups. And so much science reduces dimensionality until it reaches apparent clarity. Now that is very nice because it gives a lot of control, but it also excludes the 
input of a lot of phenomena that we cannot specify so closely, but that are nevertheless important and that have many unknown dimensions. So we need to, as social scientists, take that line and not ignore quantitative information, but actually relativize it and see both as a trajectory of learning about the phenomena that we're actually studying. Initially, we ask questions, but we don't know all the dimensions. We have gleaned the phenomena, but it, the knowledge is insufficient to define classes. And later, we can actually define those classes. So we got to combine them, combine the exploratory, part intuitive, and the final rational perception. OK. Now, we also need to ask very different questions. We need to start asking questions about the really long term, centuries, millennia. Those data are not quantifiable, but they are real and they give a very much wider perspective than a lot of the work that goes on on a very small scale and also temporarily only in a recent past. We can actually see human evolution as a process of signal processing and learning. We need to more multidimensional information, integrate high dimensional categories. And there again, there is a special role for the social sciences and the humanities as opposed to the hard sciences. Very important is that we move from studying the origins of the present to studying the emergence of the present. We, that we change from studying ex post how a development emerged to the present to actually studying ex ante how novelty emerges in the past and ultimately ends up hitting the present. So to do that, we actually need a complex adaptive systems approach, which then will reveal to us that the world is full of surprises. Because as Talab has said very uh, effectively, we have normalized our expectations to the point that the unexpected has become a black swan. But if you look at it the other way around, as emergence, actually the unexpected is all over the place. And it is only after the fact that we have regularized it to what we think is an understanding, but which in his opinion is actually far from a real understanding. So we need to also focus on the dynamics of societal learning. That is what has brought us to the point where we are now. And so that dynamic, how our society has evolved, developed, its different ways of looking at phenomena is a really important part. And then how do we get that information? There again, what is fundamental is that the social sciences and humanities take the leadership on sustainability questions. They emphasize the importance of the qualitative information. They replace the reductionism with the inverse to identify emerging new dimensions about phenomena. Shift to learning from the past about the present, but for the future. Shift from an exogenous to an endogenous perspective and, an, and the approach that goes with it. Look at the society as a learning co-evolution. And their machine learning, I think, can help us as a means to increase the dimensionality of how we look at phenomena and get it out of this mode of simplification that we have been using for so long in science. And then finally, as I said, we need to focus on a complex systems approach. We have a problem in the social sciences in the sense that many of our social sciences have been developed in different countries for different reasons to attack different problems. And so there are very many different kinds of so social science, and there is no attempt or even a wish for the ideas that we develop in the social sciences to actually be generally universally applicable, as we see in the natural sciences. So it's very difficult to combine our work 
in an encompassing perspective, but we need to do that. We need to move from the individual to collective work. We need ideas to be developed collectively by the international community. We need developing of transdisciplinary systems thinking. I'm always struck by the extent to which systems thinking after its first blossoming has actually disappeared from our curricula. We need to also accept that in order for things to be accepted, they need to be validated by repeating experiments in different places. Now, what, where we are helped is to deal with a really fundamental problem, which so far was inevitable. And that is the idea that we take a sounding or a questionnaire or whatever it is, apply it to a thousand people, and then get the conclusions from that and apply those conclusions to millions. That, of course, is not the way it is. That l sort of smoothes the differences and therefore also suppresses the ideas that might emerge in a particular process. So we need to promote process modeling on large artificial populations. And that enables us to model the emergency, emergence of novelty. And then finally, we need to promote multiple alternative visions of the future. Now, let's also talk very briefly about the barriers. The ones that we all know are the silos, the departments, the faculties, the schools with inward foci, narrowing specializations. We have career structures that narrow efforts. It is very difficult emotionally to actually think outside the box. And there is very little support for that. It's also materially difficult in the sense that although there is more and more funding for this, it is still not all over the place. Another limitation of the funding is that most funding is for three years. And it is my experience, and not only my experience, but that to actually do good transdisciplinary efforts takes at least six years before the first publications come out. Something that I feel very strongly about, and that is recent, relatively recent, not fully recent, is the extent to which publishers and journals control the content of what is actually being said. Mostly narrow spectrum because of the competition and the index values for journals. I wonder if academia could not move to referee online publications without the in interference from the publishers that need to make money off our backs. And then finally, I think one thing that we need to begin to think about is how our current education system in much of the Western world actually limits the possibility to think outside the box. When kids in kindergarten or primary school come together in a class, the teacher has two main aims. One of it is to instill values. The other is to create, promote creativity. Now, what happens in actual fact is that because those two are relatively at odds with each other, many teachers try and create socially acceptable values around a story, a set of values that are called a truth. I think we would be much better off if early in our education systems, we would actually instill in kids the idea that there is always alternatives and that they need to be evaluated against each other. All right, that's all. Thank you very much. Talk to you later. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, all three of you. We had first uh, Dr. Rampile's uh, big picture vision, uh, vision with a specific, a specific emphasis on, on the African constellation and its possibilities to contribute. Then by Jake Jacobs, uh, the description what social scientists and humanities can contribute in general and giving in direction. And then finally, Thunder, uh, Sander van der Loeb, uh, who is giving a very precise description on what points the social sciences and the humanities could interfere and take the lead uh, of uh, sustainability policies respecting 
cultural dimensions and regional specificities. All of the presenters are now available on the chat, on the Zoom chat, and you can, all your viewers and uh, listeners from a distance can address directly the questions to them through the Tube um, video um, YouTube channel. And uh, of course, also the participants here on, in the studio are invited to uh, uh, ask questions. We have roughly 25 minutes uh, for the next uh, uh, um, pause where we uh, will bring in new people on the Zoom um, chat and prepare that condition for the next uh, or next discussion. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Will one of the Zoom uh, spectators uh, raise a question and ask uh, the, the present and presenters a question? Otherwise, you would give the word to Professor Pinto to, to yes. raise uh, maybe a one or two questions and then mm. come us. Wow, thank you very much. Three great uh, talks, great ways of thinking, of, of putting ideas. I would like to start with our last speaker, Menner van der Leeuw. I enjoyed very much uh, also your, uh, your own experience as a translator between hard sciences and uh, the humanities. At the end, you said there are always alternatives. But during your talk, you, uh, you mentioned the unexpected. And me, as a, as a scholar dealing with uh, from the humanities but dealing mainly also with with the arts with uh, mainly with the intangible heritage with the performing arts the unexpected is always very central and very important so our concept is not and this is what i understood a bit from your from your uh, your points uh, our, our position is not to combat or to eliminate the unexpected, but is to learn how to deal with it. I think this could be a, a way directed to the future. Maybe you can just make some uh, remarks. Yeah, very on this. happily, and you raise what I think is a very uh, important point. Before I do that, though, I want to say one thing that I didn't really mention when I was this was being filmed, and that is that I am addressing with this talk basically the hard science community. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and it is relevant clearly to the social sciences. But I come out of a world where mostly the hard sciences have dominated for a long number of years. And I feel that that has fundamentally to change. Now to come to your real point, the unexpected. Look, I may have a very strange perspective, but if we look back about four centuries, science was in a totally different shape as where it is now. And very little methodology had been developed. But because of the foundation of the Royal Academy, which insisted that people demonstrate what they say or prove it, the function of science became focused on the relationship between the past and the present, because you couldn't demonstrate anything for the future. One underlying question that I have for all of us is if we were to very much more deliberately try and focus on the relationship between past, present, and future, we would indeed do, I think, ultimately, exactly what you're saying. We would try and find ways to integrate the unexpected mm -hmm. into our current vision. And I think that is where I would be driving at if it was up to me. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, I just wanted to um, briefly say that um, um, I very much appreciate uh, Manfela's perspective from Africa. And having worked 25 years in Asia, I would like to say that Asia is now the, the economic hub of the world. And uh, I think Asian perspectives are equally important uh, and need to be heard. And there's a real need for leadership in the social sciences coming from within Asia. 
And I must say that uh, having taught at an Australian university, we have a lot of students in uh, uh, doing MBAs, business studies, uh, economics, and so on, but very few in the social sciences, very few. It doesn't seem to be a very great interest, and I'd really uh, would like to encourage any uh, listeners in Asia to, to, to come forward and to encourage more, 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 more thinking in the social sciences from that Asian perspective. And I saw we have Fatwa El Gundi in, on, the, on the chat, and I would like to invite her to comment on the North African perspective uh, from the Arab world, if, if that's technically possible. Uh, uh, North African perspective mm -hmm. on, let me give you on an sustainability. example yeah. on sustainability. Let me uh, share with you something that I think is very informative for all of us and add knowledge. I was invited uh, by Qatar University to uh, go to Qatar and build the social sciences in 2006. I stayed there for a decade. And um, that was part of an initiative that was started by the university under the enlightened woman president, Dr. Sheikh al Masnad, uh, which is to introduce sustainability in education. And I was invited as a social science person to come in and build the social science, science within the sustainability uh, program. So that's the background. Uh, I think we can learn from what happens in real life situations. It was a big challenge, but I would say it failed. The project failed. And I think we can learn as scientists and developers and politicians from failures in the real world. Uh, you ask yourself why it failed. Uh, we introduced changes, we introduced um, ideas from the West, we introduced technology. They already had technology, but we introduced it in the, you know, through the social sciences and we, um, modernized uh, education in the uh, Qatar National University, but the students, the parents, the teachers were very unhappy and it all came to a head and they protested to the point where the Emir of Qatar uh, came to the university to discuss it with, with them, what's wrong, why they didn't like the reform that is being introduced which is coming from the West, wholesale imported from the West to modernize uh, the system. Well, after listening to them, he asked the university to cut the reform project in 24 hours and to go back to the original system. And that was dramatic. That was shocking, it was dramatic. A, a lot of money went into that, a lot of expertise, a lot of talent from the West, a lot of ideas, a lot of models, and all of this came crashing down. And in 24 hours, we had to go back to where it, it was. In my own case, I tried to salvage the situation of my experience by breaking the process of intended uh, sustainability to smaller units. And I focused on the smaller units. I can, uh, in this context, uh, go into detail. And I focused on these smaller units and they succeeded. And I would say I did introduce small unit sustainability. University of Qatar by focusing on these smaller than leaving out the general reform, reform project. So I left disappointed that all our work went down and the, uh, the president of the university was uh, removed. They have uh, they changed to a system. If you, if you look at what we learned from that, it's, it was said, it was presented um, earlier. Many comments um, alluded to that. 
context. The importing a system from the West wholesale um, was a big shock for the faculty, for the students, for the, the parents. The parents were very unhappy at what was happening. They said, what was wrong with our culture? What is wrong with our civilization, uh, civilizational uh, culture in the Arab world? We have academies in the Middle Ages. We had, we introduced uh, Arab science. We introduced all of that. Why should we necessarily get the social science of the West? That's one context. The other thing is that sustainability projects should take in consideration population. Population size. This is a case where a minority are Qataris and a majority are migrant workers from the outside. That develops a very complex situation in the society there, and we have to take this in consideration. Mm -hmm. Whom are we talking to? This is a society with a minority natives, citizens, and a majority from the outside Asia, Africa, Arabs, and so on. Also, they, so it is not only the population size, but the population character. All these social categories there. The social inequalities that exist in Qatar are different from the social inequalities that exist in the United States. This context has to be taken in consideration when you build a, a sustainability model. And so I, I, that's my assessment, that this is why it failed. Yeah. OK. Well, thank you. Thank Can you. I just intervene here, please? Yes, go ahead, please. So I want to, sh to correct the impression that what I was presenting was only applicable to Africa. It's not. What I'm, I was critiquing is the assumption that the Euro-American definition of universality, which has been dominant in our social sciences, in our uh, physical and other sciences, is something we need to shift. And what has just been said about Qatar uh, is also an interesting example that I talk about Africa and you decide to separate Africa between North and South. Why? Because you, you never talk about, I mean, it, it's, it's always very interesting, this uh, desire to separate Sub-Saharan Africa from North Africa. And that's part of the problem of the mentality we bring to the social sciences, which is very much influenced by the mechanistic fragmentation separation, command and control, which is part of the industrial mentality. And so, for example, Gary was talking very eloquently about what uh, FDR did in the, um, in the face of the depression. But what FDR did was fantastic for America, but not fantastic for the rest of the world, because he was completely the blind spots about the slavery in America at that time. Continue, despite all of that boldness and the bigness. And so I think if we as social scientists and humanities want to shift the paradigm away from this unsustainable pathway we are on, we need to shift from the assumption of universality when it comes to Euro, American issues or, or thought processes that we simply apply them across. What I described about the relatedness, the importance of pluriversality and the relational aspect of being human applies to Asia, to all areas where indigenous knowledge is still valued as an important starting point. And so I think what we really need to do as social scientists and humanities is not to simply broaden what we have, but is to question the very paradigm of our own uh, approaches to what it is we want to learn, how we learn it, and how we learn from the mistakes of the past. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a wonderful uh, 
position. I think this is uh, the core of what we try to achieve is to shift from a natural focus, natural scientific focus approach to a broader approach of the cultural uh, uh, dimension because all form of natures, first of all, have uh, also uh, uh, a cultural interpretation. The way we see nature is already expression of our cultural schemes of interpretation. Therefore, it needs to be in the forefront of the sustainability uh, issues in policy and in research. So maybe I would like to ask uh, Gary if you could uh, comment on the last uh, uh, proposition that have been made by Fatwa and uh, Dr. Ampili and uh, Sander. Gary, we can't hear you. Can you put the microphone on, Gary? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I've enjoyed the present, both the other presentations uh, very much and can resonate with so many of the points that the other speakers have made. Uh, in giving the example of FDR, I was only really trying to illustrate one point, uh, which is so often forgotten in economics. The example was to illustrate the importance of the subjective dimensions, which are not in the textbooks at all, and were not being applied in the economic theory. And I was really trying to address the issue, which uh, uh, Saunders has also raised in another way, about the tendency of the social sciences to become mechanistic and reductionistic because of the success of the natural sciences beforehand. And I was also trying to illustrate by mentioning the importance of the individual. And it's amazing how even in the social sciences, how often we neglect that extraordinary characteristic of the human sciences is that we don't just follow laws of, 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 of similar behavior. We also have that capacity uh, for uniqueness. And... Uh, uh, I, I mentioned very briefly in my presentation about the Green Revolution in India uh, and attributed it uh, to the thinking of one person who happened to have been a minister in the government and a farmer. And he said, if we take the latest technology in the world in hybrid varieties, we can double the food grain production of the country in 10 years which essentially means that we can do in 10 years what the society has done over 10,000 years of civilization. And when he proposed it, it was laughed at. It was laughed at even by the members of his own party in the parliament. And his faith was not in the technology at all. His faith was in the farmers. And the success of the Green Revolution was not due uh, primarily to the technology which has been shown elsewhere, it was due to the fact that he understood the process of social change and of motivating tens of millions of, at that time, not now, but that time, uneducated farmers to radically and dramatically change their behavior. And he said, essentially, we have to provide them with the incentives and the social organization which they lack to encourage them to behave and conduct uh, differently. And I think there's been so much of emphasis on either the laws of economics or on uh, the, uh, the, pu the public policies that we've very largely forgotten the subjective dimension, which both Mandela uh, and Saunders in different words uh, were mentioning. When we're dealing with the human being, we have to ask ourselves, first of all, uh, why will, what, under what circumstances will people be motivated to change their understanding, to change their values, to change their awareness, to release their energy, to change their behavior? And how can we support and facilitate uh, that process? And this comes to sustainability as well. That's why I started by mentioning uh, in my opening remarks about the crises we face today, the crises we face today are being reduced to uh, degrees of temperature uh, and uh, 
and, and similar variables, uh, but they really get reduced to human values. And our concept, I, I loved what Sander said about the silo effect and everything, and his, the point that he made, uh, that there's no unity in the social sciences. We seem to be not just across countries, but even across disciplines, we're talking about different species. Hmm. The assumptions, the psychological assumptions of the economist about what motivates human behavior are very different than the psychological assumptions of the psychologist or the anthropologist. In the social, in the natural sciences, we have a, a fundamental conception that builds on itself. We're working with different species almost in different disciplines, not just because we're in different countries. In the Before we started the meeting, Mambella uh, mentioned to me about the, the notion of survival of the fittest uh, and, and the application of that to human systems. Hmm. And yet, for 150 years, it was the dominant thinking. It's still the dominant thinking in, in some areas. It never accurately described the way human beings in, in social systems work. The competition was always there, but it was always secondary and a sub to the fact that civilization has been based on human relationships, positive, mutually beneficial human relationships. We wouldn't even have language uh, 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 or, or trade or commerce or any of the other things that have, or cities, if it hadn't been for that. And yet we've become so wedded to, uh, to notions that are completely divorced from reality. And I mentioned a second one, which we lived with for 50 years and is only now being discredited, uh, uh, Friedman's idea that the, the role of corporations is only to maximize shareholder value. It was never that. And yet we live with superstitions uh, and, and fixed conceptions, uh, and they dominate the way our society works because we've taken the, the human value out of it. We've taken the importance of the human values, the cultural values, the plural vers, uh, versatility that Manfella talked about and depreciated it. We've dehumanized ourselves in much of what goes for the social sciences today. And I think okay. we have to bring back that. Okay, thank you very much, Gary. I think this uh, is a, a clear statement uh, emphasizing the need for transdisciplinary research because if the discipline among themselves don't agree on a common proposition position then the more it's important to deal with the people directly in the field that that will be the the real uh, actors of change so they will make also a decision what will be taken on from the scientific standpoint and what mm. will be implemented. So I yeah. think that's a, a wonderful yeah. uh, outcome of, of this um, uh, short session. I would like to give now the word to Anne Nick from uh, the Club of Rome Charter Europe. She will be the chair of the next session and maybe make a little comment about all this what has been said in respect of teaching and education, how we can implement that in teaching program leading then to the next session uh, of tomorrow, but not, but maybe may, may make a little bridge to, to the, the, the educational side in 90 yes, seconds. Uh, I'd really like to thank Mampili for a, a wonderful, inspiring uh, contribution. And it is indeed what I try to do here. I'm based in a, in a European, West, very Western, very high-ranked university. I take my students through a process of unlearning this concept of development and opening to uh, biomimicry and indigenous wisdom. And they tell me it changes their lives. But of course, the whole system around them does not reward them for that kind of knowledge. And I would like to bring that back to what um, uh, Sander uh, van der Leeuwen said about, uh, I think based on Lumen, that our society, the Western society, does not communicate with the environment, as opposed to, I think, Abhi Ayala and Ubuntu, uh, where Mother Nature and uh, Pachamama is communicated with. But we don't. We talk about it. That means we talk implicitly with it. We treat it. As a, as, a, as a partner around the table, you know, call it externality. And I think that means that the information 
uh, that we use about this environment does not just have blind spots, but it is actively distorted because we use a money system that drives us towards extracting financial value, uh, as Gary said, from nature or from human interactions. So for me, education for the 21st century is certainly based on systems thinking. It's based on unlearning these notions of human progress equals natural exploitation or exploitation of other nations. And it also implies relearning that money basically is an agreement among people in a community to use something as a means of exchange or a store of value. And that we need to take that power back again from banks and <laughs> governments who in, you know, gave it to, uh, to private banks that do not have long-term you know, ecological or societal goals. They have private profit goals. So I think students need to learn how this communication through money is actively distorting not only our relationship among each other, but also our relationship with nature that we do talk, maybe not with, but about, and that we use, and that it threatens our survival. And I think the, the, the most important, the, the question that I'm sometimes struggling with, I get a lot of students from, uh, from Africa and from Asia, and they come to Europe hoping for a better education and a better future. And then here I am telling them, don't believe what this university is telling you. So I'm, I'm often struggling with that uh, dilemma. You know, they come to us hoping to, I guess, you know, to get share of our wealth and our development and our progress, while at the same time, we're at a tipping point where we're saying, no, we want to learn from you. You hopefully still have that indigenous knowledge and wisdom. So okay. that is, a, I think, a dilemma that we have now in education yes. that okay. hopefully we can discuss a bit yes. further. In the Thank you very much, Anne. We have a question. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. We have a question out of the, the chat from Hermine Baer, who is asking to comment on uh, the claim that the individual can bring change. Mm. I can make that a short comment, but this is, of course, a question that will remain throughout uh, the, the, the conference. I think that it's very complicated, but we have a, a good insight in that, the role, uh, how individuals or subjects of, of uh, action are interlinked uh, with uh, social structures. But some social scientists are saying that what people are doing is just the outcome of social structures. But we have to think that all social structures have been implemented, built up by individual action over time. So all these structures are changeable. So therefore, I would say the initiative of the individuals is very, very important. But I'm also convinced that individuals cannot uh, 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 succeed if they don't have the, the necessary social and cultural conditions to bring their ideas through and to, to bring change about. So yeah. that's why we need both sides uh, of, 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 the, of the coin, the, the social and cultural constellation on the one side and the space for individual action of, of innovation and change. Yeah. I leave it with that for the moment. I mean, yeah. we need to close may, may I, the session. May yes. I something, Benno? Yes, Carlos, please, but very short. Uh, short we need to change for yeah, technical a short comment because I wanted to emphasize the central role of epistemological shift, which was very explicitly present in the, in the presentation by Mampela, and uh, which is about transdisciplinarity. We talk about transdisciplinarity and mobilizing all disciplines. This goes much beyond just having the disciplines with their current conceptual frameworks all around the table in equality of conditions. This goes to the point that Ilya Prigozhin made when he said reality is richer than any language. And this goes to the point that we are not able to frame a reality in our languages. There is always something beyond that while the purpose and the, the, the mission, in a sense, of natural sciences has been to understand uh, reality as much as we could. And from that, the temptation of controlling reality is there. Mm. 
the shift we are talking about is forgetting about that. We cannot control emergence. Thank you and very much, I Carlos. I think we will talk more about yes, that later. Yes, exactly. Thank <laughs> you much for that input. We continue on that certainly over the next uh, sessions. We have to close this session now for technical reasons. The next session will be chaired by Anes Nick, as I already said, and I hope to welcome you back. Uh, you now on the Zoom, especially also for the last session on uh, Thursday afternoon, how to implement all the results of the discussion we have in, in practical manner and uh, but now we have to close and hope to see you back uh, in 10 minutes time thank you very much thank you yeah welcome back to to the second session the title of uh, the session is uh, the same again, focus on the cultural and regional dimension. And we will have two presentations, but I will first you introduce you to, to the um, chair of the session, Anne Nick. She is, uh, has a PhD in philosophy education and is working at the University of Leuven. And she's also a member of the Club of Rome EU chapter. Thank you very much, Anne, for taking the chair of this session. And the floor is yours, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, the session will start with two short presentations by Mathieu Denis, who is uh, the D science director of the International Science Council. And that will be followed by uh, a video by, or a short introduction by Thomas Reut, that we, who we already heard in the discussion this morning, who is uh, an anthropologist connected to uh, the University of Melbourne. So um, after, after the videos, there will be room for uh, reactions amongst the, the, the panelists and also your comments in the, in the YouTube channel are very welcome. Um, so thank you and let's have the videos. Uh, I, I just a little ad additional question. If you ask uh, a question in the chat, uh, the YouTube chat, chat, it would be really nice if you could just uh, say where you're from, or just we have some idea of who's who's uh, watching us from which part uh, of the world. And uh, I see that there's already uh, one question on. I guess that money distortion of human interaction deserves more elaboration. Uh, so we'll see maybe in the in the in the discussion afterwards if that is a theme that we can um, uh, discuss a little bit deeper. And I would also like to add that the Club of Rome, uh, of which uh, of course we all know, Mampili Rampili is a co-president, uh, co and we also have Carlos Alvarez Pereira among us. Uh, they have a, a hub on uh, on sustainable finance or financial innovation. So I'm sure we'll have some very interesting. Uh, discussion and comments and insights to share uh, on that. Colleagues, thank you very much for having me. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to share um, with you some thoughts on the conference topic. The title I've given for this um, short input raises a question about essentially the knowledge we need to respond to global challenges such as sustainability and climate change. And I want to organize my, my input around essentially two thoughts. The first one, um, I would like to start perhaps with by highlighting something which I find, a fact that I find quite striking. And it is that the notion of transformations has become part of our uh, standard language of the major global reports and assessment. And I think that's an interesting development that we've seen in the past five years, but no more than the past decade. So if you take a random look, for example, at reports from the IPCC, from the World Health Organization, FAO, um, UNRISD, 
um, clearly the Global Sustainability Development Report, but also reports prepared by research programs like Future Earth or NGOs like the Club of Rome, chances are that are high that you'll find references in there to the need for deep um, socio-ecological or social transformation. And, and the notion of transformation is being also central to the recommendations that these reports put forward. And I find that, that quite striking. And I think that the new sanitary and economic realities created by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic have made that call for deep social economic transformations even more urgent. Can give you an example. In a recent consultation of about 300 experts that my organization, the International Science Council, together with the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, IASA, in Austria, have made, um, the, the, um, the critical need for deep social transformations repeatedly came right at the top of the world, world's expert, international experts' recommendation. But here's the thing. What exactly do we mean with transformation is never addressed in those reports. How do we transform our economies uh, and towards what? How do we transform our behaviors and towards what? How do we transform our relationship to nature, to our environment? Who are the agents of such transformations? And, 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 and you know, critically, who gets to decide which transformations are desirable? These are critical questions. They're at the core of as I said, the current, uh, an emerging consensus within the science and policy community, um, but they are never addressed, or at least insufficiently um, addressed. And obviously, this is an area where the social and human sciences have a lot to contribute. Clearly, we can argue, it's easy to argue, that to a large extent, social and human sciences were born as as attempts to understand uh, deep social transformations produced by the Industrial Revolution. And one could similarly argue that analyzing and therefore contributing to shape uh, transformation has always been at the core of the development of social, um, uh, of mainstream, if you want, social sciences over the past two centuries. But somehow, that wealth of knowledge about past transformation is not revisited, rearticulated, translated to help address today's global challenges such as sustainability and climate change. So that we have discussions around transformative actions towards sustainability, around transformational policies towards, you know, to address climate change, but we never actually tap into a wealth of knowledge that we have on past transformation. I think that's a problem. I personally believe that this is a moment for critical contribution by the social and human sciences, where they have a unique and necessary contribution to make. And there are simply just not enough mainstream social science inputs into those, those discussions. That was the first point, colleagues, that I, was, uh, that I wanted to make. I'm going to put that on the table for further discussion um, with you. Um, the other point that I would like to make uh, that in, 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 in connection with the, 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 uh, the, the title of that talk is uh, it's related, but it's slightly different. It concerns the, the participation of social scientists in, in what we call interdisciplinary um, research projects on global challenges such as, as climate change. So interdisciplinary, essentially, uh, uh, natural and social sciences or social and human sciences together. And, and I'd like to raise the question around the conditions to ensure a genuine participation by social scientists. And here I'd like to take um, a step back and reflect a little bit on my, my own experiences, my own experience over the past um, decade or so working in international science organizations such as the International Social Science Council, and now the International um, Science Council. And I would like to um, um, stress that 10 years ago, 
a lot of the emphasis in our action was put on a arguing that there is no single discipline or family of disciplines that is equipped to solve sustainability issues um, such as climate change alone. In other words, to make things clear, the natural sciences alone are not equipped to uh, address and respond to the challenges, the sustainability challenges, and therefore we need the input of the social sciences. We've put also a lot of emphasis a decade ago in trying to articulate and capture what exactly is the specific contribution of social sciences in that area, sustainability, sustainability science. I don't think we need, that we need to make that argument anymore. I think there's been progress. I think, in a way, um, um, no one now is questioning the fact that social sciences, social and human sciences, are necessary when it comes to try and produce the knowledge that will help us respond to the big challenges of our time, sustainability challenges such as, as climate change. But obviously, in practice, that collaboration, interdisciplinary research, remains a challenge. Um, so, in a way, the question is, you know, how do we walk the talk? How do we ensure genuine participation of the social sciences in interdisciplinary um, research project? How do we ensure that social sciences are participating on equal footing with um, other disciplines? And here, we can say many things, um, but here, you know, uh, but again, based on my own experience, working with others, obviously, but in establishing uh, interdisciplinary research projects and in funding such research projects and in running them, I would like to um, insist on the importance of putting in place, right at the beginning of a project, the right conditions for the participation of social, social scientists in those projects. And that would include different things. A, acknowledging, recognizing, the fact that the timeline for interdisciplinary research is different from standard research. We, need, we simply need more time at the beginning of a project to uh, uh, jointly frame the issue. You need to involve people from the different disciplines right at the beginning in the, at the, in the joint framing of the issue that they will work on together, not bring in the social scientists, because this is what I'm talking about, at a later stage when the issue is already framed. You need more time right at the beginning also to find a common language that will uh, you know, be used within, um, within that project. So that's one aspect. Recognizing that, that the timeline of interdisciplinary research is different from standard research. Evaluation of those projects need to be done by interdisciplinary panels, which themselves require time to agree on the criteria that they will use in their joint process. And the third aspect that I would like to um, put on the table for consideration is that we still need specific efforts to mobilize the social sciences and ensure that mainstream social sciences tackle the big global challenges that our societies are confronted with. Um, we need to treat sustainability, climate change, and other global challenges not as subfields of social science research, but really as core, as part of their core mandate. And one way that we've experienced works in trying to you know, prompt that, mobilize efforts, is by Organizing funding for interdisciplinary research, social and natural scientists working together, but projects that are um, led or co-led by social scientists themselves. So create the opportunities for social scientists to take the lead in running interdisciplinary um, research projects on um, sustainability um, issues and other global challenges. These are the two thoughts I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much again for, um, well, for listening, and I'm looking forward to your question and our discussion.
Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion on the humanities and social science for sustainability. I'm Professor Thomas Reuter from the University of Melbourne, though I reside currently in Germany. And I've been working for many years in the Global South. Uh, so as an anthropologist, uh, I have an understanding of the particularity of, of different cultures and societies and the way they uh, both experience and need to respond to the sustainability problem. First of all, I would like to just uh, observe that uh, the nature of the sustainability issue is extremely complex. Uh, the kind of changes that we need are deep and systemic and not superficial. You cannot uh, solve a wicked problem like this simply from one particular angle. There is a need to approach it from all angles at the same time. That's why everybody on their own tends to feel disempowered and unable to answer the challenge. That's not surprising at all. What we really need to do is work together uh, in transdisciplinary teams. And that means also teams that uh, include natural as well as social sciences and humanities experts. Um, in particular, uh, you know, in, in this current age of, you know, that is known as the Anthropocene or the the age when uh, human, human uh, action is actually one of the, the, the major forces shaping the, the Earth's uh, physical systems, it is undeniable that the human factor looms large today. And an understanding of human beings and human behavior, human sociality uh, and worldviews is essential if, if we want to understand why, why it is that despite the by now you know urgent threat um, that comes from climate change and biodiversity loss uh, and many other uh, 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 aspects of, of the decline of nature's uh, uh, capacity to sustain us and other life on this planet, we, we need to, to understand that as, as a a complex whole in which the human factor looms large. And that means um, when we talk about geophysical systems, it's not just a matter of physics and chemistry and climate science. It's also a matter of understanding society, culture, and, um, and our philosophy of life, you know, people's philosophy of life and, and how, how that uh, impacts. Uh, in the in the last uh, decade or so, there's been quite a push uh, and quite a few symbolic actions to promote uh, transdisciplinary research. Uh, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, I was involved in the uh, process of a merger between the International Social Science Council, which is the uh, umbrella organization for all the social science unions, the international unions, and academies with the with ICSO, which is a, a similar organization for the natural sciences. Now, uh, that was a, a very nice uh, gesture, and uh, I, I uh, supported that, but I feel that not a great deal has changed, and that's because the real power to determine uh, the shape of research lies with the national research councils, the governments and their agencies that fund researchers such as myself. And if you uh, launch an application for a transdisciplinary uh, project, you tend to put yourself at a disadvantage. Say if you have a, a project involving chemistry um, and uh, uh, expertise on, on, on water and expertise on social science, then you, the, the danger is that if you try and please uh, one assessor who's from the social science end, you'll disappoint the others. And if you try and please them all, 
you end up disappointing them more because they all feel that, well, this is not really, a, you know, the kind of chemistry project I'm used to uh, seeing or the kind of social science project. So in the end, those projects tend to not get funded. And there's, uh, uh, I think, a real need for um, national funders to set funds aside specifically for this kind of integrated research in order to promote it. And that means also perhaps training assessors to understand the nature of these these uh, uh, projects. Because these projects break new ground. They, they start new conversations between people who don't usually work together but need to work together now to deal with the kind of wicked problem we have, the kind of complex, um, uh, uh, intricate problems we face, you know, and, uh, questions such as how, how can we transform society to uh, eliminate uh, fossil fuel use? You know, you, you can't do that simply, you know, by looking at the climate signs or, you know, counting emissions. You need to look at the politics of it. You need to look at the financial aspect. For example, I was recently involved in a... Uh, a UN and World Bank project uh, on on how to uh, change the uh, in investment industry and uh, the finance industry and how to change money flows to realize the the sustainable development goals of the UN and also to uh, combat uh, climate change, uh, both mitigation and adaptation. So, you know, you have to look at all aspects of life. And you need expertise in all of these fields. And it's great when, when people can come together and it's really interesting for everyone. And it's not just across disciplines, it's within science, within the knowledge sector, but also across sectors. And I would stress the need to, to involve, for example, business, civil society and government in, in the, the quest for... Uh, 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 solutions, because those sectors have also knowledge and skills that are absolutely essential. And of course, they're also stakeholders. So integrated solutions is what we need. And um, there are a number of ways in which social science specifically can contribute. And I will speak uh, a little bit about anthropology as, as an example. Now, anthropology is the science of human diversity across cultures. And culture is something we understand as a complete systemic way of life. So the systemic complete way of life we have now is not sustainable. We know that. So how do you change somebody's way of life? How do you overcome change resistance in, in, in light of the fact that... Um, uh, Generally, uh, people will resist changes to their, their, their worldview, fundamental changes, that is, not small changes. Small changes are acceptable, but deep change is generally resisted because if you threaten people's way of life, they think their world is going to end. They think it'll be the end of the world because it's the only world they know. But if you look across human cultures and you see all that diversity, it gives us hope because it shows everyone that there are other ways of living. And I'd just like to remind that many of the countries um, in, in the world today that are you know, part of the so-called global south actually still live in, in a sustainable manner. And the more they become developed in, in the, the sort of conventional way, in the non-sustainable way, the more they... Uh, um, uh, environmental footprint grows, so that's that's really telling. That it shows that the, the kind of development pathways we've been pushing have not really have really been destructive. So, and on the other hand, uh, all that all those different cultures also have different solutions, and need to they need to be unique. We have one problem, but we we need a thousand different solutions locally, and um, there's also hope in that because. The innovation that happens in one culture may also be an inspiration to others, and we need ways of sharing that uh, knowledge across uh, local actors. That's absolutely essential. Uh, something I'm I'm working on intensely at the moment, 
um, for providing a platform for the exchange of knowledge across, uh, uh, among local actors worldwide. So in any case, uh, uh, to sum up, uh, I think the humanities and social sciences are at the heart of any solution to the problems of the Anthropocene, the human human age. And um, uh, it's it's very important that we all learn from each other and work together uh, because we do only have this one world, even though we may have our many different views and ways of life. Thank you. Um, by way of opening the discussion, I would just like to give maybe a short reflection on uh, something that um, came to mind when I listened to both uh, your presentations. Uh, there is a lot of talk about what we need to do, what needs to change in the system, uh, how the funding has to needs to change. But uh, this morning we also talked about emergence, something new is already emerging. Um, many people are doing things differently. Open science is happening. We're not waiting for the fund funding agencies. And I think, and I'm now speaking as an educator, uh, part of what explains the, the change resistance uh, among young people is fear. Um, all they know is that the, the world that they grew up with and that they have been told is, you know, the, the most developed <laughs> possible uh, civilization or world, uh, lifestyle is about to die or is about even to kill them. So for lack of knowing there is an alternative or embracing an alternative, they, they hold on to, to, the, to the sinking ship. So I think showing them, as uh, Thomas was saying, that there are alternatives and there is a, a huge emerging uh, landscape of um, of people who do it differently, but also ancient knowledges, the whole decolonial uh, movement is so hope inspiring uh, to show that yes, there is, there are other cultures that can thrive within planetary boundaries. And, and um, so I would, I would, uh, I would really uh, stress that as a, as a very important message. So I think beyond uh, talking about what needs to happen, we should also we could also look at what already does happen and that we can uh, join forces with by by putting it in the focus of of academic research and education and that brings me to a, a, a reflection on the fact that we we often speak in about transdisciplinarity but it's it has become like a, a bit of a, an umbrella concept and for many people it's still, we still start from the, the disciplines as the experts. And then one step further is they start to talking, talk with each other to tackle a complex problem, which I would call interdisciplinary. And then the next step is that we also include people we don't call experts, uh, you know, the, 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 the people in, in the field. But I think transdisciplinarity is really a paradigm shift where we where we let go of this very narrow definition of what knowledge is, as has been ex uh, you know excellently described by uh, some of the speakers this morning, and recognize that people who are uh, really embedded uh, in, in the reality of, of local uh, local contexts have this holistic real life experience of embedded knowledge, embodied knowledge. I'm talking you know. In, with a gender perspective here, that that knowledge, that kind of knowledge is today, maybe, you know, at least, or maybe more crucial to, to decide what humanity, you know, what, what course humanity will take than all the expert, expert knowledges brought together. And maybe even the, you know, the, the concept of expert is, is to be questioned radically. Like if, if we're saying now, you know, young people from, from uh, Africa and, and Latin America and Asia come to European or American universities to hope, you know, for what they believe is still believe is a better life because you know colonial thinking is is had led them to believe that, and so to say no, maybe you are the experts in Ubuntu, uh, Pachamama, you know. Uh, 
again, these holistic and, and ecocentric worldviews. That is, I think, the, the real tipping point that we are on and, and the role of the, ex the expert, you know, can be the expertise in a small field, like, like Thomas was explaining, can be a small piece of the puzzle, but it's not by starting from one piece of the puzzle that you can decide what the whole puzzle will look like. It's by looking at the first, um, the, the first, uh, you know, the, the, the bigger picture of a globalized society and then deciding together what contribution each um, uh, discipline can have. So maybe I would like to uh, ask Mathieu uh, and also Thomas to maybe respond to that, um, since it's a reflection on your, you know, this, this, this difference between interdisciplinarity and, or transdisciplinarity as the interface between science and society versus transdisciplinarity as a radical new paradigm uh, for, for uh, you know, how we, how we control, how we develop and co-create knowledges <laughs> rather than knowledge and how that would reflect on um, what, you know, your work in the International Science Council or in the platform that Thomas was describing. So, Mathieu, okay. can I give you okay. first? Sure, thank you very much for that, uh, Anne. Um, I, I, I fully agree. So, I fully agree. In a way, um, in a way, framing the discussion in terms of how do uh, uh, disciplines collaborate uh, is while it's very important, in a way, is a discussion that we've been having for a long time, and that we need to we need to be aware that um, by and large, uh, we've moved away. <laughs> a lot of people have moved away from from that particular academic uh, discussion, uh, and they're now looking critically and actively. Uh, at ways, developing approaches, creative ways to involve people, the people directly affected by the problems we're trying to solve, uh, involve them, A, in the definition of the problem, and B, in perhaps even the production of knowledge. And that's, these are efforts that, as International Science Council, we've been actively supporting uh, by testing, piloting different uh, types of, of research program, even though you know, we're not directly uh, a funder organization, even trying to work with funders to 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 pilot some some programs there. Um, obviously, the creation of a of a, a global sustainability research platform such as Future Earth, which puts at a, at the core of its mandate the development of, of transdisciplinary approaches, was was a key, and it was part of the whole movement that led to the creation of the International Science Council um, uh, about two years ago. It was part of that. So, so, you know, a decade of experience of working more closely, um, more closely together, natural social sciences, as well as working with with people. So that's how I mean, we're fully supportive of, of, of that. So maybe want to rest uh, can you hear me? Uh, my yes. perspective is that um, there's been a lot of talk about co-design, co-production of knowledge and so on with, with other knowledge holders, indigenous people, the general population in all countries, really, uh, local, local actors, government, business and so on. But let's, let's not forget that, you know, first of all, from the science angle, there isn't really support for that. There isn't any funding to support intersectorial work. It doesn't exist. We need to find new ways of raising funds for that kind of conversation to take place and be supported. And let's not forget that the decisions about societal change, uh, as Sandra said, really, we, we need not ecological change, but societal change, very true. And that societal change is not in the hands of ex experts. Look at what's happening in the United States with the COVID response. You know, you, you have the president of, of a very large country calling his chief advisor a fool or an idiot, I think was the word. Uh, I mean, the, the, the whole attack on ex experts, you know, it's, it's, we're not in control of, of what is happening. Science, scientists are not in control of what is happening. In fact, we, 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 we often uh, struggle to get attention from policymakers, and we don't understand their pressures very well either. And Rarely do we engage with people at the local level, with local actors, local governments. Um, of course, there are good examples. There are, there are individual researchers who uh, 
uh, put these principles into action as part of their research programs, but it's, it's, it's fairly marginal. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say uh, in response to Anne's uh, comment, yes, uh, change typically emerges at the growing tip of a plant, for example. Yeah? It, it emerges at the margins, not at the center. So it's often the, the discarded, the, the marginalized views that are the innovative ones, by definition. So, yes, they, you know, how, how can we uh, uh, support such views? How can we open up to that? And I think it's crisis that uh, uh, opens the center up uh, for new impulses that come from the periphery. And we need to, to help that by uh, empowering people at the periphery, by giving them a voice, a platform. Mm -hmm. if, if I can just, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, if I can just, I, I, I would agree with that, with that as well. And, and to come back to your point, Anne, about fear um, propelling change, um, I, I fully agree with you. At the same time, obviously, um, fear is not um, always a good motivation for change or, you know, it can lead to different things. And if fear turns into panic, then obviously, you know, we don't know how things will, will turn out. Um, so I, I would agree that we do need now to look critically uh, at how we can scale up uh, the experiences, the positive experiences that are being developed in the margin and try and see how we can bring in more actors into, into fostering um, that sort of, just sort of, you know, positive experience. Uh, not only in the sort of the, the dominant uh, uh, science systems, but obviously as well look critically as, as how they can be also um, developed in other parts of the world where, for example, social science uh, capacities are not as, as developed but are critically needed. Okay, I would like to give the word to Fatwa yet. Um, I want to emphasize the uh, effect of what happened from the pandemic on some of these points. One of it is, I think there was a need for preserving the integrity of the different disciplines and their methods. So integrating or interdisciplinarity and so on shouldn't merge them so that we lose the uh, positive aspects of the knowledge in the, in the, I'd like to see the integrity of science observed and integrate or collaborate is a better word, science with social science rather than, and this was uh, prominently uh, demonstrated with COVID. People wanted to hear the scientists about what's happening in the pandemic. They want to know what are the symptoms of the disease? What have the research telling them about the vaccines? They wanted scientists, they didn't want social scientists, and they didn't want to merge these. So I would say that collaboration is important. Why preserving the integrity of these disciplines? And I take that to culture as well because of something that Anne says. Just to say that we don't want the domination of important models doesn't mean that the West has nothing to give. In fact, I am. I think that it's very good for uh, the, uh, the young people and the youth to come from, um, uh, we'll call it global south or developing world and come to the West and learn the skills. This is very good. There's, we cannot suddenly reject the West and the Western science. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not, I, I, to me, this is not acceptable. I think we have reached a point where we can all collaborate in the pot. The, the new global uh, dynamic is includes West and East and what was done before is a denial of the subdominant cultures, telling them they have no wisdom. But we want their wisdom, and we want the wisdom of the West because the West took the world to a, a, a certain level that uh, the global world needs now. If I can just add one small thing in answer to Tom and others who are talking about funding. I am a uh, social science consultant at the moment, 
at Qatar National Research Fund. And they introduced a new kind of grant. They call them cluster grants, which use exactly that format that we're talking about science, social science, and so on. And guess how much they give per grant? Five million US dollars. Now I'm on a panel to see if these grants are worth that <laughs> much or not. But um, there are some parts of the world that we have to really uh, dig into and see where we can, um, you know, collaborate. Thank you. And yeah. In uh, I, your point is taken, very interesting. I think what you said about the, the, what, um, the reaction to the pandemic, I think it relates back to what Mathieu said, you know, if we panic, we will hold on to the, to the, to the trusted uh, models. And it has been compared also with, you know, if, if you're in, in, a, in a flagration, you do have to, uh, I mean, conflagration, like a big fire, you focus on your, your firefighter technologies and you also focus on doing fire drills with the people. And it's not the right time to think about how can we do fire prevention or make the world more fireproof. But at the same time, if we only focus on the specialist high tech and, you know, uh, interfaces with how can we get the, dis the, the discipline, the expert knowledge, uh, you know, pass it on to the people so that they listen uh, and, and with the, the scientists, we're never going to rebuild that world that is this holistic world that is based on different values and different concepts of what development and well-being means, because part of the conflagrations come from that model. They, they are, there's the, yeah. price, the price we pay for that. So maybe uh, if somebody I else think, from uh, the... I, can I just ask if other people from the... We have to close, maybe uh, Carlos or Sander would, uh, or Gary would like to re uh, react, just so everybody gets a chance to speak. Okay, otherwise, Thomas, yours, yours the floor. Yeah, I just wanted to respond. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Fatwa's comment about the integrity of science in, in light of the COVID crisis, very good point, because what the crisis has shown is that Scientists do not have all the answers. We do not know it all. We're not in a position to tell people what to do. A lot of the time, what we have are the tools to find out. And with COVID, there was a catch up. And it's very good for the public to, to see that uh, scientists were debating, they were researching, they were trying to get on top of this problem uh, on the run, okay? So science is always, uh, true science is always a process. It's always evolving. It's not some kind of fixed canon uh, uh, that from which you can draw uh, instructions on how to respond to the sustainability problems, for example. It, it doesn't work like that. There was a question from the chat about design. Uh, in, uh, how, do, how do we design uh, interdisciplinary research projects? And I think uh, it's, I think Sander said before, it has to be from the beginning. It has to be, uh, the, the framing uh, needs to happen, uh, right, uh, the joint framing or co-design has to happen from the start. And it does take time. It, it, there is another step before you can commence the research and that needs to be considered. So these projects need a longer life, a slightly longer lead time to develop. Yeah, we just uh, come to back to this question in the chat from Javier Francisco. Yeah. The wording is, how can interdisciplinary research projects shift towards a research design suitable mm. for natural and social sciences? How do we reach political decision makers in the EU and German ministry, etc.? So I think this is a question that needs to be uh, kept in mind for the discussion that will follow. I think this is one of the key issues I can maybe just say my, my uh, answer to that. Um, I think that nearly all funding systems on the national level, on the European level and so on, on the sustainability issues are dominated by the natural sciences and the, and the engineers. And I was working for 12 years on the European Research Council and, and so on, and I, I go, uh, think that I have a quite a close uh, perception on, on the mechanisms 
and I tried to put on several um, projects. Uh, and the question was always if this view is put onto the social sciences or the cultural aspect, you are, you are not fulfilling the criteria of the natural sciences and the engineering sciences. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. they are important, but you cannot be ex excluded because you are not just sharing the key stakeholders in the funding system. My view is very simple. We need other funding systems. We have to get rid of, 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 of we need to have, uh, <laughs> alternatives to that. Otherwise, we need another couple of decades to, to have another vision of it because these people have contracts for, for many years and they will not change their mind in, in, because we are holding here a conference. The, we need alternatives. That's my simple view to answer Javier Francisco's question. Thank you, Benno. I think what you were saying that, you know, we, we get no funding or, you know, people who want to do transdisciplinary or even interdisciplinary research get no funding because it does not fulfill the criteria of science those criteria of science, you know, the, this whole normative framework of what normal science is, that is the paradigm. Yeah. So I think it brings us back to the to the position that maybe we need a paradigm shift. And I would like to give the closing remark to Carlos. Carlos, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And just to react on this point, because I think we will have time to discuss uh, more about that later. Let's not uh, mix. When we talk about natural, the role of natural sciences and what we understand uh, and the paradigm of natural sciences, let's not mix um, the evolution of natural sciences, which is, and particularly of physics, which in a way is uh, astonishing, you know, because physics has done the work of renewing its own paradigms. Whenever uh, the existing paradigms what was uh, showing its limitations, uh, physics has elaborated a new paradigm. And, uh, and, and partially the discussions about complexity and complex system science, which uh, Sander, uh, Sander uh, uh, illustrated so brilliantly in the previous session, have come also from physics. Let's not mix that with the political interpretation of uh, what means a scientific paradigm means, which is much more limited. You know? and, uh, and in general, uh, this interpretation is still connected to classical mechanics, you know? And, uh, and in the, it, it has, uh, of course, uh, um, it is almost everywhere, in particular in the way projects are conceived, in the way funding is conceived, etc. But this is not natural science. Let's not blame the natural sciences for what is elsewhere. Okay, I will. I will have to. We have to stop here. Time. Time is uh, has run out. Uh, I remi remember from Carlos' intervention that natural science is doing paradigm shifts. So if we could have them do a paradigm shift to include quantitative and value-based and social uh, embedded and embodied uh, knowledge to solve, to tackle the big problems. Uh, we have made a big step forward. And I thank you everybody very much for your contributions. We have not had the chance yet to address all the questions in the YouTube, but we have new sessions after lunch and uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yes, we will start at uh, two o'clock. Um, uh, COT, uh, that's uh, in about um, hours, one hour, one three quarter uh, uh, time. So I hope to will be, you hope, hope that you will be back and we continue with a presentation by Hartmut Rosa and then uh, Professor Pinto and uh, some other speakers in the afternoon session uh, and Martin Leiner in the first uh, session, afternoon session. Thank you very much for listening and watching and hope you will be back in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome back to the conference on humanities and social sciences uh, for sustainability. Uh, we had some uh, make, make some comments uh, from the uh, 
responses we got from uh, the chats. In general, they were asking for more time for discussion. We tried to, to implement that. We had a, four, a 15 minutes break for technical reasons to, to, to welcome the, the people on, on the Zoom and, and, and to establish, but apparently this is uh, going very well, so we'll try to, to have a little bit more discussion. And there will be a small change in the program after uh, Hartmut Rosa's presentation uh, in a couple of seconds. We will have first uh, the presentation of Martin Leiner and after that the presentation uh, of Thiago uh, then uh, right after and we will have um, sufficiently discussion of this time uh, uh, to get into the detail. We have now first of all the live presentation of uh, Hartmut Rosa, I already introduced uh, this morning for the people that haven't followed this morning session. Uh, Hartmut is uh, the director of the Max Weber uh, Center for Advanced Cultural Social Studies at the University of uh, Erfurt and the professor for the theoretical sociology at the Friedrich Schiller University of Jena. And of course, he is um, worldwide known as the author of Social Actualization and um, Resonance Theory as a theory of um, uh, modernity of the present time. Hartmut, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Benno, for the kind introduction and for, for organizing this and setting it up. I think it's really important that uh, on a global level we come together and think about the problems of st sustainability because it seems that for all of us this is really the vital problem we are dealing with now. We have heard this uh, it this morning uh, already. Uh, but um, I, I think it's worth a while starting with the insight that knowledge per se, important as it is, does not do the trick, right? Because we know enough actually to take action and to change our way of life, uh, the way we organize the economy and the production and consumption. Uh, and actually it's not just that knowledge per se does not um, is not sufficient to change our course of action. It actually seems that those who have the best knowledge about uh, environmental processes and, and ec uh, ecological dangers are exactly those who engage in practices which are worst for sustainability, uh, detrimental uh, to it really. This I find uh, very disturbing. It's precisely those social groups and classes which, have the, which are best educated and have the best knowledge about environmental processes which nevertheless uh, have actually the worst carbon footprint, right? We have, uh, we, we, you know this and we have uh, studied it for a long time. So one might think that, okay, if it's not knowledge, then what is it? And then very often we think it's values, right? It's value orientations that are uh, decisive uh, for, for us. But uh, the, actually our studies do not support even or confirm even that hypothesis because you see that those who really, uh, you know, we do a, a world value surveys and things like that. And uh, again, it's exactly those who have the highest esteem for sustainability, those who put sustainability or climate questions or environmental questions on top of their uh, agenda in terms of what they value, what they care for or what they worry about. It's exactly those who have the worst carbon footprint or ecological footprint. And this is really surprising, I think. And there we see, when we, th we discuss things like we discuss here, we want to turn towards a day, we reach a global understanding of how we have to live and how we have to organize society in order to reach sustainability. Then obviously we have to start from the insight that the problem lies very, very deep, right? In, in my point of view, I would say it's the, the most, it's the deepest level you can get to. It's our basic orientation towards the world, our basic stance towards the world. And the question is then, how come that no, neither knowledge nor values per se uh, are sufficient to change our course of action? And uh, for this, I, I would like to, to really give a very short uh, um, um, impression of my analysis of modern society. I, my, my claim is that the way our society operates on a global level, particularly, of course, on the economic level, um, it can be described with the term of dynamic stabilization, right? Each year, we need to achieve um, economic growth and a technological acceleration and cultural innovation in order to stay where we are. Right? This is why everyone from Silicon Valley to the EU and uh, and, and to people in China and, uh, and Japan and everywhere, they try to get, come up with disruptive innovations, right? with uh, processes of acceleration. And uh, the, the goal is uh, also, of course, to achieve economic growth. And we need this 
in order to keep what we have, right? Without acceleration, growth, innovation, we cannot sustain the number of jobs and companies and not the health system and the old age pension system and so on. I don't want to really go in, in depth here, but uh, it seems to me, to me to be important that this is part of the reason why knowledge and values are not enough, right? We live in institutional fabrics which require that we participate in, in practices and engage in actions which are not good for the environment. But nevertheless, I believe underneath the, the uh, economic framework or the social, uh, the social for institutional formation, there's also a cultural underpinning. And this, for me, is now uh, right now uh, uh, most fascinating, right? I claim, uh, I'm, um, it's quite interesting to use an idea by Charles Taylor here, who once spoke of a, a declaration of spirit or a spiritual declaration of independence from nature. Right? And he says that's at the heart of modernity. And I found that quite interesting, right? Because the idea is that we, are, we live in a world which we try to understand, but then also to to control and to use. Right? So it's it's not it's 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 you know it's not not necessarily there's nothing bad or, or wrong with it. But the idea is that we declare ourselves spirit spiritually independent of nature, and then we try to control it and command it. Right. And now when you bring this together, the need to permanently increase, to innovate and to accelerate and a certain stance of, um, uh, of, uh, of you could say, opposition to uh, nature where the good life is defined as a life which permanently increases the horizon of what is known, what is uh, available, what is accessible, what is attainable, right? This is culturally our conception of the good. And I believe, so, uh, so my claim is that this uh, leads to a stance of aggression towards the world almost, certainly aggression towards nature which you see on the ecological level, of course, with the extractive industries, there is a moment of aggression, make more and more available, attainable, accessible, right? And of course, on the other side, the pollution, the emissions is the other problem of, um, of, of this, uh, this stance, right? So making the world available, attainable, accessible uh, leads to a form of, of aggression towards the world, which has a cultural side and a an structural and institutional side. Um, and, and, but there is one interesting thing. Well, I mean, there are many interesting things here. But I think, you know, this stance of pushing the limit of what we can have, of what we can control, of what we want to dominate. You can see this, I believe, even in something which I wholeheartedly support, right? Like the, uh, the UNESCO uh, Sustainable Development Goals. When, when you look at them, you see it really is this stance of permanently pushing the border, giving better access to health, giving greater access to knowledge, securing better housing conditions, right? giving better education and informational technology access and so on. I don't say anything is wrong with this, but it's interesting to see that we have, this is our basic attitude towards the world, right? increasing the horizon of attainability, availability, accessibility, and I think this invariably leads is connected uh, to problems of, uh, of the environmental situation. And, and it has a paradoxical consequence, which I'm most fascinated by, right? And that is that we, have, we are very successful in increasing the horizon of uh, attainability, availability, and accessibility. I call this the triple A horizon of the good, right? And, um, and thereby we have come sometimes close to, to acquiring almost omnipotence, right? Or at least a, 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 um, we have increased our powers. But this has a strange flip side. It, it, it gives us or it creates experiences of complete powerlessness. Right? To give you an example, when we look at the way we, uh, we, we have come to conquer the atom, the ad uh, matter, right? So with nuclear fissure, we really have come to master matter, atoms, uh, 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 nuclear energy from the inside, right? So we have vastly increased our powers, but at the, exp at the price of uh, uh, creating experiences of total powerlessness when there is a nuclear chain reaction in an atomic bomb or a nuclear power plant, um, explosion and basically this is our experience with the climate disaster too right when people think of nature in our world that's at the heart of the sustain sustainability problem right on the one hand we have really come to understand nature to control nature to dominate dominate and use nature in many aspects but when people hear nature nowadays at least in the so-called western world right they most often think nature is the thing with uh, which is threatened by us and which then becomes threatening to us 
right? So I think it's the same logic. We have become almost omnipotent in controlling nature, but the flip side is, oh, there might be a climate disaster, ecological disaster, which leaves us totally powerless because it might, as we have heard this morning in the welcome addresses, it might eradicate the whole species, right? So what we have is a cultural, economic, social situation technological situation, where on the one hand, we have become very, very powerful, on the other hand, totally powerless. Right? So I think what we need, I think what should be part of, of, of global learning, and there we can gain global understanding really through intercultural discourse right, and learning. Because I think what we need is a kind of medium stance. I, I'm not arguing for submission to nature, just accept what is there, listen to nature. That's difficult. I mean, actually, I want to argue for a listening future, for a listening society, but not just listening, not submissive. We have to follow the traditions of, of or the paths laid by history or so. What I have in mind is a, is a stance uh, of which I call a resonance stance towards the world. And that, that includes a stance of resonance towards nature. And it means getting away from a, a stance towards the world or an orientation towards nature, which is going for control and domination. And preservation is just an element of this domination in this mindset. And what I mean is not that we preserve something out there, but that we get in a kind of dialogue with natural, natural forces, natural components, of course, also with history and with other people. And resonance means I'm listening to what is there. I'm not trying to dominate and control it. And I'm not aggressive towards it. I listen, but then I also answer. That's the second element of resonance. The first is affection. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm affected by what is there. I listen to nature and its many voices, right? And then I answer it. I, I develop self-efficacy in answering it, in going about it, but not in an aggressive stance. And thereby I transform myself, but we also transform what we experience as nature, right? So resonance is a, is a, is a form of relationship which has these three elements, affection, listening to the other, answering, experiencing self-efficacy, not being submissive, transforming, permanently being transformed in this process and transforming the environment. But we cannot go for, to totally, for total control um, and domination in this process, right? And maybe, I'd, so what I would want to argue for, and this is what I want to close with, is a new stance of responsibility, right? Responsibility towards nature, but you can um, replace the I with an A, responsibility, ability, which means being capable of being in a responsive relationship in, in the social realm with other cultural traditions, social traditions, and in a responsive, responsible relationship towards nature. Thanks a lot for giving me the time. Thank you very much, Hartmut. Uh, a lot of uh, points to discuss later on. But uh, first of all, we want to watch the video by uh, Martin Leiner. Martin Leiner is a theologian uh, prof a professor for theology at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, and he is especially also the founder and director of the Jena Center for Reconciliation and the co-founder of the International Association of Reconciliation Studies. So the point is, is making, and also in his presentation later on, that after disastrous experiences of genocide, uh, dictatorship, uh, and so on, uh, that people are opposed to each other, how to bring them together again. And I think this is a very important point with all the problems we are confronting probably in the future, uh, that uh, with all the higher speed of disaster probably occurring to climate change, if people get in an aggressive mood, it's even more problematic. So there is a, a strong link between Hartmut's presentation and what Martin Lehner now is uh, presenting. So please uh, start the video now, and after that we will have uh, Tiago's presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Martin Lehner. I am professor at Friedrich Schiller University in Jena in Germany and at the same time director of the Jena Center for Reconciliation Studies. I'm also the president of the International Association for Reconciliation Studies and of the Academic Alliance for Reconciliation in the Middle East and North Africa. I'm very glad to talk in this conference organized by the UNESCO Chair for Global Understanding. Since its beginning, UNESCO was very much interested in a culture of peace 
And it's also my aim today to show you how sustainability and work for peace and reconciliation are connected and how they can work together. There's a lot of things already people do for reconciliation and peace, but it's sometimes like in chemistry that only with a certain temperature a reaction really happens. And my claim is and my idea is that many things must come together and they must work in a sustainable way together in a long-term perspective that there can really be a change. So I will talk about reconciliation and sustainability. The main essence of this conference you have already in this uh, quote of Abraham Lincoln, the very famous quote, a house divided cannot stand. He gave it uh, before the American Civil War and uh, it's also an allusion to a biblical text. What is divided cannot be sustainable. This is the main lesson of this uh, quote. And now if we look into surveys on countries around the world, there was a huge survey organized by BBC with the Ipsos Institute and uh, the item, uh, we live in fairly divided societies, uh, was uh, answered by yes, by more than 90% of uh, the population in countries such as Serbia, Argentina, Chile or Peru. And more than 80% even in countries uh, like Italy, Hungary, Great Britain, Poland, US, Spain, Brazil, uh, South Africa, Russia, Germany even, and Belgium. And the countries with the fewest yes were Saudi Arabia, still 34%, China 48%, Japan more than 50%, and the others you can read on the slide. And there is also some suspicion that maybe some people in some countries do not feel really free to say we live in a divided country. And so there is a lot of uh, tension and division in the countries worldwide. And this is a picture to show this world how it can be seen as divided. There are a lot of divisions. You can distinguish scholarly, there are wars and open conflicts to divide countries such as Yemen or Ukraine. There are militarily frozen conflicts with borders where there is no possibility to cross like in Cyprus or uh, Georgia with Abkhazia. And there are politically frozen conflicts like the whole American continent. We have parties who are strongly opposed and dividing the society, left and right, Democrats and Republicans. And uh, in many countries, they are the basis of deep divisions on politics and culture. There are frozen conflicts in an economic way. South Africa started this uh, policy of reconciliation in the 90s, but it is stopped because of the economical divide where black populations still are living separate from white population in uh, townships and there is not a, a great evolution to be po possible. There are cultural divides. Belgium, Canada from the languages French and Dutch or French and English. There are East-West divides. Some countries in the East are different from the West, Poland for example or Turkey. There are cities, countryside divides very strong in countries such as Thailand or China. And there are also religious and um, ethnic divides like uh, you all know uh, Myanmar with this ethnic state and the Rohingya or refugees are also um, attacked because they are seen as uh, culturally and religiously different. So we live in a divided world and uh, the effects of these divisions are there are low levels of trust, empathy, understanding and cooperation. There are high levels of security costs, fears and stereotypes of the others. There are dangers of destructive, violent conflicts which can break out. And all this is a contrary of sustainability. 
destruction of human lives, infrastructure, cultural heritage and nature could be the consequence of these divisions which are often under the surface which, but which can break out in open conflicts. And now I would like uh, to see a bit of for the reason there are often injustices and atrocities in the past who are underlying those uh, divisions. They create fears in the background and cycles of violence and uh, destructions can break out and can break out again. And this uh, happened, for example, in Syria. This is a picture of Syria, city completely destroyed. And uh, what could be the answer? The answer could be to start anew with a new flag of uh, cooperation and living together and uh, work together. And the contribution we are trying to give in Jena is to build up reconciliation studies. It's a quite new academic field, and I now will give you just a very short introduction into the basics. Uh, definition is that reconciliation studies is a scholarly description, interpretation, and evaluation of processes of creating normal and, if possible, good relationships. And this is between states, groups, organizations, and individuals reacting against past, present, or preventing future grave incidents, such as wars, civil wars, genocides, atrocities, forced displacement, enslavement, dictatorship, oppression, colonialism, apartheid, and other human rights violations and injustices. So you might uh, have some ideas which come to your mind very quickly, like South Africa, Rwanda, Germany after World War II, Northern Ireland, uh, but a bit everywhere around the world, people are struggling to come together and to live together again after such grave incidents and such uh, wars and uh, human rights abuses. A bit in a larger perspective, you can say that under the surface, uh, all reconciliation process uh, has five dimensions. It is a reconciliation with oneself, which is very important that we can uh, find ourselves as ourselves again, and that we can live in peace with ourselves again. Then with others, which are different groups, persons we have to face, individuals, groups, uh, states, organizations. In the same time, we are also members of our own groups, and these own groups, maybe they are fostering reconciliation or they are against. And also there must be the loyalty with this group requires also a, a special effort for reconciliation. Then we have the whole topic of the environment, of the nature. We have to reconcile anew with environment and with transcendence for religious people with God or what they are believing in, but everybody is believing in something, in the sense of life, in the truth, in what is really important in its life. And here we must also reconcile if we see we did not live up to what we are believing in and what was all our best ideas in life and values we should follow. So in all those five processes, are a package. They are always going together. Sometimes they are going into conflict with each other, but you cannot reconcile with one part against the other, with yourself against all the others, or to reconcile with your own group but not with other groups. This is a very important point. The whole thing is being interconnected, as we are all interconnected in this world, and we feel have these policies to reconcile in a state with some groups and not with others, or in a country and against other nations, this is not sustainable in the end. The thing is, to, you must take it as a whole and you must go um, for reconciliation uh, with all and not against others. So this is a symbol of our center. And uh, here are some ideas. It's important to 
work with structural violence such as poverty and exclusion, a culture free of from hatred and respect is something we found a lot in our uh, researchers in psychology, how important is mutual respect. Mutual trust, cooperation, confrontation with violences and injustices in the past, and also it's important to encounter in the, in the present the others and to have deep exchanges also including, if possible, apologies and forgiveness, reparations and to construct a common future together. This is all these three things are important to have together. And it's about breaking like the chains we have of violence and war and mistrust and uh, opening uh, for a better connected world with more love. This is what is the aim behind all these researches, which are very much scholarly researches we are doing on the very classical experiments, uh, seeing how people are reacting in political science methods, uh, sociological methods, in discourse analysis, in uh, um, data. We are working with big data also. And all this um, leads us that uh, what can lead to reconciliation, there are a lot of practices we found which, is, which could, should be combined. It's uh, political and legal uh, elements uh, like uh, to clarify disputed questions. It's uh, about a common security architecture because security is a very deep need of people. Apologies, reparations, um, symbolic acts in the um, public are important because it can change the culture. Cooperation in economy and also in other issues are important. Mutual help in disaster, for example, can change also the attitude of countries towards each other. Cooperation in civil society, city twinnings, exchanges, students and others on all levels. Uh, confrontation with history to change the narrative because in still in many countries the narrative is very nationalistic. We were the good, maybe the victims and the other were the bad people and they had not the just cause, we had it. This must change to a more a true image of what really happened and this uh, should be also changed and uh, related to a more reconciled way to work with the past, not to keep hatred alive and stereotypes alive. Humanize the image of the others. School books uh, should um, be changed and should be worked on. The discourse of religious and other leaders should work for reconciliation and understanding. Uh, many people cannot reconcile because they are deeply traumatized and it's an important investment to go for trauma therapies we found in our researches and intergenerational issues are important because there must be programs to transmit the experience of atrocities but also of uh, uh, reconciliation to other generations so it's important that reconciliation is a long-term project. It has uh, many generations, three, four, five generations to work on it to get really a sustainable change. And if uh, many people work on this sustainable change, we can create such a world more united in uh, understanding and in peace in all those five dimensions I talked about. And I would like to thank you very much for this very short introduction and for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin Leiner. You will be with us tomorrow in the, in the studio. Our next presentation is uh, Tiago Del Vero Pinto, uh, sitting next to me. Um, I already introduced him this morning also, but important for, for his presentation, I think, is that he is, um, was and is a professor of um, University of Sao Paulo, be the biggest, uh, largest university of Latin America, and at the same time, he's a PhD in, um, in, in Berlin, Free University, and is now a professor for transcultural music studies at the Franz Liszt University in Weimar and holder of 
the UNESCO chair with the same name. So we will have first a short video and after that we will have something, a little surprise produced by Tiago. Hi there, good to be with you. My name is Thiago de Oliveira Pinto. I'm the head of the UNESCO chair on transcultural music studies at the University of Music Franz Liszt Weimar in Germany. Our UNESCO chair is one of the very few UNESCO chairs devoted to the study of the intangible cultural heritage, ICH, or living heritage. What are our research approaches in regard to the cultural dimensions of sustainability? This is a very basic question. Or in other terms, how does ICH influence sustainable development? My brief comments on these issues are based on experiences gained through our collaborative research projects in South America and in Eastern and Southern Africa. Natural resources and the environment have ever since been expressed through cultural activities. It is no surprise, though, that the study and the safeguarding of ICH has always dealt with local sustainability. The cyclic celebrations of the year or national events to acclaim identity, among many other manifestations, they are all strongly tied to or even embedded in the overall environmental context of people. These facts provide special significance to the cultural interpretation of natural resources. While building conceptual and theoretical frameworks for research in the humanities and in the social sciences, these specific relations between cultural actions and the environment must be considered. In the study of performing arts, one of our main goals in, in research projects, their material artifacts and their intangible outcome the natural resources at disposal gain importance right from the beginning of our research. Musical instruments are built by the use of local resources. Ritual sites are constructed accordingly to them. Life cycles in the calendar of a village or of a community are always externalized, echoing the respective environment. Space always correlates with time. While time is the history and the memory one remembers, keeps and is proud of, space is the territory and its environment, which offers the economic basis of people. The selection of cultural heritage already inscribed into the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of UNESCO is quite big and very diverse, be it in such practical issues as in food security through agricultural techniques or through the fabrication of goods for local use or even for the export. Any society is influenced by the exchange with its environment, while it, the environment, at the same time supports and orients these exchanges. Furthermore, ICH is mainly a strategy to maintain the balance of a society. The unrestricted connection of cultural actions with sustainability basically functions as an element of social cohesion. Due to natural disasters and climate change or conflict-related damages and the destructive impact of infrastructural, national and transnational remodeling of the landscape, substantial alterations of the environment occur. They will always be responsible for the dramatic loss of basic resources for the ordinary living and will seriously restrain cultural life. Therefore, the study of the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage or living heritage and sustainable development must reflect on the relationship between both fields, 
cultural life and sustainable development. Summing up, the chair's research concepts are guided by the notion that sustainable development is defined as an organizing principle for assembling human improvement goals through the use and support of natural resources as provided by the ecosystem services. These resources are considered alongside cultural outputs, since only in the combined action of ecosystem and culture can the economy upon which a society relies on be fully secured. Thus, research objectives are grounded on the recognition of the interrelations of ecological, educational, social, economic and cultural sustainability. This conceptual orientation secures the chair's close cooperation with several other UNESCO chairs from different disciplines. At the end, any study of living heritage has to be placed in the core of the sustainability debate. I'm very much looking forward to our interdisciplinary meeting and to our discussions. Thank you very much. So, and there I am again, but this time with an example of what I was trying to say. I will pick up two ideas of, my, of the previous speakers. One is the idea of reconciliation mentioned by Martin Leiner. In this case, I will show you, show you reconciliation between nature and humans. And of course, another claim put by Hartmut Rosa, uh, which I'm very much supportive to, is his idea or really his claim to say we must listen to nature in a different way. Uh, this morning we, were, uh, we, we spoke about two organic living systems, the ecology and society. While ecology, nature, is something which is more or less fixed within its systemic unity, society is changing and society must change, of course. I brought here an example. This is a Umhube musical bow from the Kosa people in South Africa. This is a wonderful example how people behave with nature, in this case with physical acoustics, so with sound. The basic uh, way this instrument functions is really very much attached to natural, to physical rules that are the same all over the world. But the way how people behave to these fixed rules, this is different, this changes, and this uh, makes each culture unique. So let's listen to this. time playing this because I'm, I'm listening here to sounds to a spectrum of overtones this is physical acoustics which are built on top of the basic pitch which is this string you certainly could perceive this melody on top of it so with my mouth I can make a selection my mouth is a resonator and this resonator makes a selection of these different harmonics which are there. 
And this is an acoustical phenomenon that is the same any part of the world, but the way how people use it. And as we heard today in the morning, how innovation occurs based on this knowledge, this is very much specific to each culture. And Hartmut Rosa knows, I mean, organs, the, the tuning of organs, he's a pipe organ player. <laughs> Uh, the tuning of organs uh, is, is something which relies very much also on, on, this, uh, on this system of these overtones. Mm. So what I want to show you with this small example is, yeah, this is a specific way of listening to, to nature, but not only to listen and, and to, to stay uh, without any, any reaction, no, to react and to use it. And to come back to some remarks this morning, uh, we can see that some people extract money or like to extract money or economic benefit from nature. But we have other examples too. And therefore this listening ideas, idea is excellent because others extract aesthetic fulfillment from that which nature has to offer to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diago. We had now three pre-presentations. Hartmut Rosa was emphasizing uh, what Diago just illustrated with this instrument from South Africa, that modernity is, the whole story of modernity is about uh, accelerization and the rather problematic outcome is that we need to go faster and doing more and more to, to stay the same. So that's mm. the complicated issue of uh, um, exploitive um, uh, modes towards uh, natural um, living conditions. And we had the presentation of Martin Leiner, who was putting emphasis how important it is to build bases, to stay together, to achieve things together as the basis for sustainable uh, forms of uh, social uh, forms of life and cultural forms of life. And finally, we had at the end uh, the example of uh, the music as part of resonance, using nature as part of the cultural um, uh, world. And I think that's, for me, a very important way to show how the cultural is basic for the way we relate to nature all together. Mm, yeah. mm. This is just a small example from music, but in fact, it's in all forms like that. Mm. Uh, mm. We shouldn't forgive, uh, forget that our economical uh, driven forces is also the uh, expression of a cultural attitude mm. toward the world. Mm -hmm. So the floor is open for discussion. We have mm. uh, uh, a question from Shanin Bittner from Bochum about the disciplinary uh, education or transdisciplinary education. I would put this question a little bit back uh, for, for tomorrow's session because uh, I would like now that questions can go directly into the presentations we just uh, followed. The floor is yours, maybe from um, the Zoom chat or also from uh, direct from the, from the public. Or if we have give some time, I would uh, go into direct and ask uh, Hartmut how he is seeing his uh, resonance theory in the wider context of, mm. of sustainability. You mentioned uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as a certain uh, political consensus how to approach it, but maybe it's, uh, scientific or social scientifically not uh, convincing in all respects. So could you a little bit elaborate how you see more uh, further consequences of the resonance approach mm -hmm. for sustainability in the sense Martin Leiner exposed it or, mm -hmm. or Thiago exposed it uh, in, in their talks? Uh, 
Yeah I, yeah, I very much like these uh, two other presentations uh, we've heard because uh, uh, what Martin Leiner was talking about, you know, it's just, I think it's just the social side, so to speak, because there is aggression too. I mean, the problem he's dealing with is social aggression, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think, you know, in the cultural realm, you actually also see it has a lot to do with our, and, and that was also in Martin's talk, uh, 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 aggression towards the self. It's a kind of, it's, it's almost aggression on all levels, in this sense of increase, right? And that uh, ma makes it very difficult to somehow change um, uh, well to change the attitude and go to some, somewhere else now therefore a lot of people think that resonance is only a, in an individual conception you have to change your mindset like like in mindfulness or so and of course this is not enough because we really have an institutionalized and a structural problem right so that, so uh, while it is true that culture is at the heart of also all the I totally agree with you with the economic and the technological way we deal with the world right nevertheless the other side becomes very solid so we have to change both uh, at the same time and I think resonance is not directly a solution an institutional solution but it gives us an idea of how it could be different and uh, actually we also need the practices of, uh, of, uh, of really enacting a different way of being in the world and music for example is one such way where you really listen and, and answer so, uh, so, so I think we need both we need a new cultural yardstick and, and resonance could be one but then we need a sense of how we transform institutions in that way Thank you very much. Uh, I had one brief comment for you uh, also, Hartmut. Uh, you were talking about the acceleration and the way we have to, we seem to have to work harder and harder just to stay at the same level. And I just wonder how much uh, sort of uh, that's a part of a uh, political economy of, of you know, um, societies like, for example, the USA, where you have to work with people like Elizabeth Vaughan before she became a senator on, on the American middle class. And the fact that middle class families need about twice the number of working hours now to yeah. maintain the same amount of disposable income. Yeah. And w perhaps that acceleration is not experienced in the same way by everyone. Well, no. Well, I would agree. I, I, I agree with that. It's not experienced in the same way by everyone, but it's experienced by everyone, I would say, in different ways, right? I mean, actually, basically, I would distinguish three forms of affection. Some are completely left behind. They are decoupled, right? Once you lose, so yeah. to speak, track, then you are lost. Like, for you could mm -hmm. be unemployed, for example, or live in yeah. a region where, where, where the economy doesn't work anymore, right? Then you are affected in a purely negative way, right? You might have a lot of time, but the time is completely devalued. Mm -hmm. And then when you are, you know, you don't have to be in the middle classes. I mean, in the working classes, right? People suffer quite heavily because they are there. They have pressing schedules. When you're a truck driver, for example, or or, or you're working on the shop floor or wherever it is, but they are normally it's it, basically it's this it's the boss or the institutional logic that puts the pressure on you, right? Mm -hmm. And when you move up the social ladder, then very much it's habitualized, it's internalized also, right? So I would agree with you. The logic of permanent increase of acceleration is not the same in all segments of society or the world but you feel it everywhere right this need to sustain what you have through uh, increase through acceleration mm -hmm. yeah. I would like to ask a question to, to Martin Leiner uh, I mean you are talking specifically about reconciliation but now the political agenda of many political leaders are just the opposite they try to emphasize the div uh, division between nations especially by by uh, emphasizing nationalist discourses for, for all kinds of global problems. How would you see then your, your reconciliation approach on the political arena? Because I think uh, for sustainability, this is also a very, very important point. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Is it functioning? Yes, yes. it is. I have a new mic and, and I'm testing it. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I have also this feeling that uh, there was a time in the 90s where politicians were much more open for this uh, uh, reconciling, uh, bringing the world together, starting a new era uh, approach. Uh, we have also this reconciliation and, uh, and now it's a bit a kind of going back uh, to nationalistic, uh, divisive uh, approaches. And uh, I think this is something which uh, humanity uh, uh, cannot afford anymore.
for a long time to have uh, such policies and uh, this huge uh, expenses in weapons, this uh, uh, threat with uh, nuclear weapon, which was mentioned as well by Hartmut Rosa. Uh, the risk that there will be a war or that there will be uh, an accident by all these things is, uh, is uh, really too high. Um, and uh, there is a quote of, uh, of Confucius who said, uh, human, humanity learns through three ways. One is uh, through uh, thinking, uh, this is very rare. Another is through experience, <laughs> this is more often and uh, uh, longer. And the more current, hardest is by suffering. And um, I ho I'm hoping that humanity will not have to learn by suffering, mm. uh, that it's not the right way. But I think it's, it's already proven that it does not function, this nationalism. Europe is an example for this. And it was renewed in the Balkan wars, in uh, Yugoslavia. Why do you not learn from this? Yeah. Uh, before I come to, to Gary Jacobs, uh, just uh, Hartmut, who was uh, say directly something to, yeah, to just, Martin Linus' uh, comment. Just briefly, because I, you know, Ben Avellen asked about the political, uh, the political um, um, state of or, uh, of re reconciliation, and I think when you look to politics, as you just said, I mean things are getting more aggressive. Its nationalism is turning aggressive towards other nations. But there is an interesting study by Michael Bruter at the London School of Economics. He's, uh, he's surveying 27 countries, uh, de so democratic countries in the Western world. He started with the United States and with England, and what he found is really interesting, namely that people who have different political opinions who are in different political camps, turn more and more hostile to each, towards each other. They actually hate each other, right? When you think of people supporting Trump in the US versus the liberals, or Brexiteers in England versus uh, Remainers, but you see it everywhere, right? It's really, go we, we are in, in instead of a, st a democratic stance of listening to the others and trying to answer them and then transform the political world into some form of uh, collective action, it's uh, not wanting to listen to the other, lock them up or shut them up, Right is the main goal, and therefore you see an increase in uh, aggression on that level too. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, uh, Jerry, Gary, it's your turn. Can you put your microphone Thank you. on? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. It's quite provocative. Uh, I'd just like to highlight a few of the things were said and try to linked them with a discussion we had in the morning, but didn't develop. Uh, uh, I think it was Hasmut who talked about that we're trying to control nature as something separate from us, uh, that mind separates us from nature. Martin said, what is we're divided from, we cannot, cannot survive. Uh, mm. Tiago talked about resonance and reconciliation. I made a brief comment this morning and never uh, had a chance to come back to it, and that is in the work of the World Academy of Art and Science in looking at our global challenges, we came to the conclusion years ago that not only are our institutions unsuitable and our strategies and our policies unsuitable and our education inadequate, but the very way we're thinking hmm. is fundamentally inadequate and this was touched on in various ways. I think when we talk about resonance and reconciliation, it was touched on by Mantella this morning. And uh, I, I would briefly try to touch on it in the sense, if you take the things that are most important to us as human beings, I mean, most central to our existence, uh, happiness or love, even society or the person, personality, these are all concepts that defy analysis through division and contrast. The, the way we've learned science in the last 500 years as an analysis of reality by dividing things and separating them and comparing them and contrasting them and categorizing them, which is a very powerful tool and it's built up uh, tremendous knowledge in the physical world, but we find it doesn't give us the whole reality. We understand the parts, but we never understand the whole. Uh, and our systems theory, systems thinking is an attempt to kind of compensate by that for reconnecting things. 
But reconnecting separate things doesn't really express the reality either. We are integrally related. Even our personalities are and our relationship to nature is. Uh, I mentioned briefly this morning, Mamfella, before we talked, was talking about this idi idiotic idea that survival of the fittest is, uh, fully explains uh, reality, uh, where our whole civilization over 10,000 years is based on cooperation. There is, of course, competition between that and their power struggles and everything. But in looking at the competition, we miss the fact that all our prosperity and all our culture is the result of our relationships, our resonance, our reconciliation. So I, just to conclude, it's a, it's a big subject. Uh, we've come to the conclusion in, in the academy, we've had uh, two uh, three-day workshops on this as the beginning of a project. Carlos was very active in it on what would be a higher or more integrative way of thinking that doesn't just connect the dots, but really looks at it as an integrated whole. And it comes back to a theme I mentioned this morning. It would mean that the subjective and the objective aspects of reality are not two different things. One is the projection of the other. The inner is projected in the outer. The culture is being projected in the social, the civilization and the organization and even in the technology and, and the way we use it. And I think it, it means that fundamentally in the evolution of our future science, uh, we have to think about changing the way we think. I'm an American from California living in South India and I have seen uh, no matter how good uh, the Indians are at mathematics and computer science and everything, that fundamentally their culture comes with a more synthetic base. Uh, when I first came here, you know, the idea of society was a bunch of people, individuals. That's the American view. We're a bunch of, we're a group, and we come together. In India, society is an integral whole. It's inseparable, and the individual is inseparable. And Benno, just to, uh, to end, uh, you touched on a very important point this morning about the relationship between the individual and the society. Uh, and of course, the individual by them, an individual by himself or herself does not accomplish in society. But we could also say the society does not accomplish without the individuality without the innovation, creativity, the thinking differently of the pioneer, the adventurer, the inventor, and everything. And our problem is, again, we've got a dichotomies. We keep dividing reality and looking, is it this or is it that? Is it freedom or is it equality? Uh, is it democracy or is it, uh, uh, is it in a, in equal sharing? And the question is, how do we reconcile these and see that the contradictions are not really contradictions? They're complementary aspects of a greater truth. And what we really need to do is find out how to reconcile those different aspects of truth. And again, to a final statement, what, we, what was mentioned this morning by somebody is our problem is we're looking for truths that disprove other proofs or replace other proof, truths rather than the truths that complement one another and help us come to the whole. Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. I mean, um, the point, uh, the survival of the fittest, um, has also denied by people like Elise Rucklu, one of the classics in French geography, or Kropotkin. They, they put the attention to that surviving is much more linked to, um, to working together than to, to, to um, looking for a divide. So cooperation is the real basic for for survival and not uh, the to show who is the fittest for whatever that's i would say the survival of the fittest is a short short term success evaluation and the long term cooperation is certainly the much stronger uh, point for for survival I would like now to give the word to to Carlos before I would come to two questions from the chat Carlos please Um, I wasn't. I wasn't asking for <laughs> for the floor. Well, I was but thinking I'm, that I'm, you were rising. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm. But I'm happy to make um, to make a comment uh, on um, prolonging on what uh, Gary said and what just putting a, 
a reference on a recent book by Lynn Gorison, a biologist, uh, titled uh, Natural, Natural Intelligence. And um, I like this idea what Hafmut uh, put forward at the beginning of the session on, on listening and listening society. Uh, to me, and I we will speak about that uh, tomorrow, um, we are stuck. Uh, what he calls dynamic stabilization, I have a more provocative expression for that. We are, we are stuck in high-speed gridlocks, so moving very fast but not, not really moving, which is the sign of a non-learning society. And at certain levels, uh, we are not learning at all. We, 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 we pretend to be, you know, a knowledge society intensive in research and innovation and technologies and all that. But at, at deep levels, uh, for instance, at those that we were now uh, described by Gary in his uh, last intervention, we are not uh, learning at all. We are a non-learning society. And we have to explore our blind spots to get out of the frameworks which prevent us from, from having this type of uh, learning. And um, so I will, we will talk about that uh, more uh, tomorrow, but I think uh, this is part of the discussion. How could we shift from a, a society which is not learning at levels which are fundamental because they are bringing us close to suicide of the species okay. towards learning what we what we need to learn okay thank you carlos i would like to know to two questions from the chat one from shannon bittner is asking what is the difference between ecosystem services in comparison to older approaches to uh, uh, ecology and sustainability? That was mentioned by you, Thiago. Maybe you can yes. just refer a little bit uh, on. Yeah. Well, uh, I, what I meant with this is, of course, a, a very specific part of, uh, of, uh, society, of nature, sorry. And we had just Gary mentioned we have uh, it's we seldomly have the idea of the whole the whole in this case is the is this eco uh, this, uh, ecological system and uh, we study and we are aware of parts of this whole and this is a wonderful example because what i showed to you i'm not going to make a musicological uh, talk here but uh, this uh, basic no this is provided by 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 this ecosystem and uh, the 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 possibility of building up these overtones here um, is similar in the whole world but the way i do it and the closer people they even interrupt the string here so they have from the basic string they have three overtones interrupting here just one pitch higher they have another three and so they construct like this a hexatonic scale. So it's a scale divided into six intervals, completely different uh, from the uh, European uh, system, which of course is temperate, which is an artificial mm -hmm. way of using this, uh, this basic. So uh, as an example of how this whole, which is nature, uh, is used uh, according to, to Dr. Man Manfela spoke in the morning about uh, indigenous wisdom. This is a kind of indigenous wisdom which is passed from generation to generation. This is a wonderful example of living heritage. And in fact, it is in the real sense listening uh, to nature, extracting something from nature without uh, uh, harming it. So this was uh, what I, I meant with this example. Of course, we could go much deeper into musicology and uh, also uh, musical anthropology or transcultural studies, because of course this system uh, has also uh, uh, went also in interaction with with uh, neighboring peoples, uh, people in the in the eastern. A cape of South Africa and so on and so on. So this was just uh, this example to show you how this can uh, can be done. So 
human beings extracting something from this ecosystem without harming, just building upon it and creating and maintaining wisdom. Okay, next question is for Hartmut from Javier Francisco. How then can we convince the large part of the population to make a sustainable shift if we don't stick to the idea of growth? Meaning jobs, insurance, pensions. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, it's quite interesting when you look to those countries, the early uh, industrialized countries like uh, which you have in Europe or Northern America or Japan or so, there we, we still do have growth, right? But people somehow feel, a lot of people, but not just the working classes or those who are really deprived, but uh, also those who are actually quite well off. I mean, they now have an incredible amount of possibilities of traveling and they have smartphones and they have computers and TVs and the fridges are too full for, uh, for their health and so on. And still people have the feeling we, we don't get what was promised to us, right? And mm. now, my, my, I mean, there's so much there's so much frustration and anger out there in the world, right? And not just on those who are really don't have enough to make a living, right? But also by those who, by, 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 by almost all the others. So I really always ask myself, well, what is it that creates this frustration and anger? And it certainly, and, and, and it clearly is um, a disappointment about that, it, that we don't get what we were asking for. And my claim is that we were, in, in fact, we are asking for resonance. And you see it when you watch commercials or the advertisement industries, right? They always promise you a really deep, actually a resonant encounter, right? Buy this trip and you will experience the heart of Africa. Or I don't know, there's a, there's a cruise with polar, polar lights guarantee, right? Buy this trip and you will see the polar lights. But also, also it's buy this car and you will have a new experience of being in the world. Mm -hmm. Or even buy this apple and you will have a new experience of nature. <laughs> or buy these chips and you will experience friendship. It's always a promise for resonance, but this yearning for a resonant encounter, being touched, affected, self affected self-efficacy and transformed is transformed in a desire for a commodity by this commodity and you can make the commodity available and attainable right but not the experience and but I think you know it's not we don't need a cultural learning program to um, tell people what resonance is because as human beings we always already know it human beings in the first place that's an anthropological claim mm. I want to make but I'm not deadly convinced about it right <laughs> even when you look at small babies when you look at uh, child development studies right the first first thing they, they, they do is trying to get in resonance with the world, right? Being looked at, being held, being touched, and then realizing that with their own eyes they can establish contact with someone else or with their voices. That is our basic experience of being in the world and later on we dislearn it, right? We forget about it because we live in this high-speed gridlock society, however we, uh, we want to call it. So I think we already have a basic sense and a yearning that is there. We just have to rediscover and redevelop it. And there are many cultural traditions, and actually indigenous wisdom certainly is a, a strong source for this too. Yeah, Hartmut, I, listening to you, I, I have the impression that you, one of your points is um, that um, a lot of the destruction of our living bases is linked to false promises. Mm. So people are living with false promises and try to, to fulfill the expectations by consuming and by by going faster and faster and faster mm -hmm. and finally uh, they are losing uh, touch yeah. with the ground yeah, yeah it's it's really interesting i mean it's not I, I don't want to say that someone is making these false promises no, no. right it, yeah it's a kind of self yeah, yeah, delusion of course. Of course, for yeah. me because i think we are always trying to i mean what what we basically do the western way however you call it of living is permanently postponing fulfillment right so mm -hmm. people think well once i'll have the, the i finished education i will start to really be to, to have the good life right and then you realize oh no education was only the beginning you have to have the job so you enter the job but then you have to take care career steps so the and, and you have to make money and find a housing and so on and the idea is always but once I have this job or once hmm. I have the house or once I have the yacht to sail the seas I? or once I go into a retirement I will start living it's really actually hmm. it's always this postponing because we always think first we have to secure the basis I have to be secure in the world and the thing is in this society which can only stabilize dynamically you will never have a secure position in the world right it's kind of performative struggle all, all the time we need to 
run just to keep the resources, and therefore the promise is never fulfilled. I totally agree with that. Okay. Mm. Uh, if Thiago? I may comment briefly on that. Just Thiago, and then yeah. you. Uh, just, yes, uh, very, very interesting that the, the way uh, we, we perceive uh, living heritage, for instance, can be, maybe can be, I don't know what you think about, exactly the other way around. So mm. you're speaking about commodities that make promises uh, for special experiences. Mm -hmm. And what we, we can see in, in this kind of living heritage is the experience comes first. Absolutely. And, and mainly, uh, and, and if the discussion nowadays is in, think about tourism industry, uh, who uh, tries to, to use these expressions of living heritage as a commodity. For instance, yeah, exactly. so exactly. it's exactly the other way around. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. But I think very, I think there are two important things. One is that resonance really starts with feeling called by something, right? Mm -hmm. There's something out there that speaks to me, and not yes. I want to do something. Yeah. And the other thing is that by since you mentioned the cultural heritage, it also creates a sense of resonance with history, right? Through time, the past and the future somehow mm -hmm. get in resonance through experiences exactly. of this mm -hmm. kind, and, mm -hmm. and we have lost body that sense many too. times. Yes. Thomas? Yeah, I just wanted to say that the, the whole experience uh, and also the, the uh, of, of acceleration, also the realization that this is a, a problem, you can already find that in the existentialists who, who call this self-projection. The idea, you know, that you project yourself into a future that never arrives, yeah. a future that will bring happiness, but you don't live in the now, you're not present, you're not able to enjoy in an authentic way uh, the joy that is to be had only in the here and now, mm -hmm. and that's the remedy. And in a way, though, the question wasn't answered, and how do we slow society down? And yeah. there are some suggestions, such as yeah. a basic wage, just, uh, paying people I a basic wage, uh, basically paying people to do less or nothing even, yeah. uh, to, to kind of, because really, what, what do we need? We need to, to guarantee that people have accommodation, they have food, uh, they have cultural activities. A lot of that is not very, it's, it's quite, quite modest, really, what we need. And a lot of the things we, we, we enjoy are actually uh, cost-free. You, know, you don't need uh, to do anything to nature to make it enjoyable. You can have cultural activities that are not resource-heavy. Resource mm -hmm. We just have to think differently about where we find our happiness. I to, just I totally a short comment and then we have Yeah, to short comment, yeah. I know. But I totally agree with that. A minimum basic income would maybe change the game, right? Because what, pe mm. what we need is to have a kind of secure relationship with the world, right? We don't need more and more and more, but we need some form of security yeah. that we don't have in that system. So that would be a good idea. Mm. And the other thing politically and economically we can do is reduce competition in, instead of permanently increase it, right? I mean, the idea is where we have to have more competition on all levels between schools and between teachers and between professors and everywhere, right? Mm. And this, of course, is one of the things where, which takes away security and the, mm. the, the, the possibility to, uh, to have a resonant uh, life right now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, discussion. We uh, have now a little short break of uh, about 10 minutes before we entering in the second part of uh, Humanities, Social Sciences topic for sustainability research. We will have three presentations by Thilo Wesche, who is uh, um, talking about legal aspects with nature. Then uh, Lutz Müller from the German UNESCO Commission, who is talking about the program of uh, sustainability sciences and uh, coalitions. And finally, the science director of UNESCO for the social sciences and the humanities, uh, the second science director after we had um, Mathieu um, Leonie this morning, science director of the International Science Council. So we'd have an interesting continuation of the topics we uh, started this morning. Sure. Hope to see you again in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, welcome back to the second part of the session topics in sustainability research from the human and social sciences. The chair of uh, this session is Anne Snick. I hand it over to you, Anna. Yes, thank you, Benno. Uh, I would just like to introduce the three speakers that you will hear in a minute. Uh, the first one is Thilo Wesche, 
He's professor of practical philosophy at the Karl von Osiecki University in Oldenburg, Germany. He studied philosophy, political science, and modern German literature at the Freie Universität Berlin. He received his doctorate from the University of Tübingen with a thesis on the philo Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. His research now focuses on the philosophy of law, especially human rights and property theories, and on critical theory, like from Adorno and Habermas. Then we will hear Lutz Müller. He is Deputy Secretary General of the German Commission for UNESCO and Head of the Department for Sustainable Development and Science. He holds a PhD in Theoretical Physics from Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich and has a background in physics and philosophy. At the German Commission for UNESCO, Lutz Müller is responsible for science policy, biosphere reserves and geoparks. And then our third speaker will be John Crowley. He is Chief of Section for Research, Policy and Foresight in the UNESCO Sector for Social and Human Sciences. Since joining UNESCO, he has also been a program specialist in social science and head of the Communication, Information and Publications Unit, Chief of Section for Ethics of Science and Technology and team leader for global and environmental change. So these will be your very interesting uh, panel of speakers. And I uh, propose we can start the videos uh, introductions now. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Property rights present us with a dilemma when it comes to natural resources. On the one hand, the achievement of property rights should not be neglected. On the other hand, property rights are the gateway to exploitation that makes global warming, resource degradation and species extinction possible. The Wanganui River in New Zealand exemplifies an alternative concept of property that I will call sustainable property. The river is neither an unowned good that does not belong to anyone, nor is it property that people freely dispose of. Rather, the river is the property of itself. The case study of Wanganui River shows us a concept of property that unites property rights and sustainability obligations. Sustainable property is made possible by the idea that nature owns its resources as the river owns itself. Nature is here a subject of law and in particular a subject of property rights. I admit that the idea of the right of nature, especially nature's right of property, provokes dissent. I will therefore confront my own position with some objections. First, the objection of a colonization of nature could be raised. By extending property rights to nature, nature would be, the sub would be subjected to human disposal and thus to the rule of commodification. This objection is dispelled by showing that on the contrary, free disposal is constrained by nature's property rights. The human rule over nature is limited by its property rights and the resulting sustainability obligations. The second objection concerns the suspicion of anthropomorphism. The objection of anthropomorphism is raised against the proponents of the Gaia doctrine owned by, by James Lovelock and most recently represented by Bruno Latour. According to this objection, the idea of nature as a subject of law humanizes nature and thus levels out the difference between nature and human beings. However, I will distance myself from such anthropomorphism by placing the rights of nature on the normative basis not of a natural ontology, but of the idea of property. A theory of nature's rights can thus do without ontological assumptions about values inherent in nature itself. Rather, 
The reason for nature's property rights is taken solely from the idea of property. In the following, the argument for sustainable property will be reconstructed in three steps. I come to the first part on ecosystem services. The value theory of property is based on the assumption that a contribution to value creation entitles to a property right. Anyone who makes a contribution to value creation has a right to ownership of the corresponding value. In short, anyone who produces a value also owns it. The question now arises whether the value theory also applies to nature. Does nature contribute to value creation? And if so, does nature therefore have property rights? First, it should be shown that nature contributes to value creation in form of ecosystem services. In order for natural resources to be regarded as a contribution to value creation, three conditions must be fulfilled. Human needs, human work, and ecosystem services. Come to the first point, needs. The value derives from the significance of a good that is important for the satisfaction of human needs. Production and consumer goods owe their value to the needs to which they contribute. Therefore, the value of natural resources is constituted by their significance for the satisfaction of human needs. Come to the second point, work. In addition, natural resources usually can be used only through their processing by human work. Stones are formed into road pavements, proteins are modified for medical purposes, and carbon compounds are processed into fossil fuels. Only through the human activity of work can natural resources be transformed into usable goods. Come to the third point, ecosystem services. Needs and work are necessary but not sufficient conditions for the value of natural resources. A further condition are those ecosystem services that make natural resources valuable for the satisfaction of needs at all. Ecosystem services include not only substances such carbon compounds or qualities such as flammability, but also processes such as solar radiation, food cycles and ecological balances. These properties are not produced by humans, but by biological, chemical and physical long-term processes. Nature thus makes a contribution to value creation that differs from human work. I come to the second part about nature's right to property. It is now necessary to show why the notion of ecosystem services leads to the assumption that nature has property rights. If natural resources contribute to value creation, why are they nature's property? The argument is based on three premises. The first premise is the rule applies that value creation entitles to property. The second premise is Human work and ecosystem services are two types of value creation. The third premise is the rule that value creation entitles to property applies to every type of value creation because of its lawfulness. From this follows the conclusion that the rule that value creation entitles to property also applies to nature. Accordingly, Nature possesses property rights of its resources. The third premise should be examined more closely here. Two concepts of rule have to be distinguished, a particular and a universal validity of rules. The particular rule concept states that a rule only applies to those cases that fall under the reason for its validity. Freedom is the reason for the rule, value creation entitles property. The validity of the rule is therefore limited to free beings and thus to human work. 
The universal concept of a rule, on the other hand, means that a rule applies to all cases which fall under its scope. I consider this universal concept of rule to be the right one, for reasons of lawfulness that makes a rule a rule. The rule that the creation of value and titles to property has as a rule a lawfulness according to which it applies to every case of value creation and thus also to ecosystem services. Whenever a value is generated, the right to ownership follows, since the validity of a rule includes its lawfulness according to which the validity must be generalized for all cases that fall under the rule. Humans, property rights in natural resources cannot, cannot therefore be established consistently without nature's property rights in its resources. If human beings claim the rule that value creation justifies property, then it follows from the lawfulness of this rule that it also applies to nature. Therefore, if property rights are justified for humans, then it is also justified that nature possesses a right to property of its resources. I come to the third part on sustainable property. The property rights of nature implies a concept of common ownership of natural resources that humans and nature share. Sorry. This common ownership is justified by the fact that both humans and nature contribute equally to value creation. Joint ownership implies certain obligation to sustainability. Humans have a particular right to ownership of natural resources. For them, however, natural resources are also property that does not belong to them. Due to the protection of property, this property imposes certain obligations on its users. Anyone who therefore uses property of others is obliged neither to damage it nor to destroy it. Humans are obliged to use natural resources in a sustainable way. There is an obligation to conserve natural resources because they do not belong to humans alone and must be respected as the property of nature. This obligation to conserve natural resources is a duty of sustainability inherent in the idea of property. Because natural resources are also the property of nature, and property protection obliges users to treat the property of others in a sustainable way, humans are therefore obliged to treat natural resources in a sustainable way, for, we, for reasons inherent in the idea of property itself. Free ownership of natural resources is constrained by sustainability obligations inherent in the idea of property. Sustainability is not a claim external to property, but results from the logic of property. Property is therefore an argument not against, but for sustainability. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, participants of the conference Humanities and Social Sciences for Sustainability. The United Nations have declared the period 2020 until 2030 to be the decade of action. In doing so, the United Nations have reaffirmed the 2030 agenda while at the same time pointing out that the efforts made so far to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are widely insufficient. Action is urgently needed simply because time is literally running out for a number of goals. For example, if emissions remain the same, the carbon budget to reach the 1.5 degree target, which was declared urgently desirable in the Paris Climate Agreement, would already be exhausted by the year 2027. Second, the traumatic loss of biological diversity continues to accelerate 
dozens of species irretrievably disappear altogether every day. Third, global inequality is constantly increasing. Ten years ago, the wealth of the poorest 50% of the world was equivalent to that of the richest 380 people in the world. Today, it is equivalent to that of the 26 richest people. And fourth, sociopolitical responses so far to te technological innovations such as artificial intelligence are completely inadequate, such as to be able to humanely shape the impact of these technologies. The implementation of the 2030 Agenda is now more urgent than ever. In fact, the interim conclusion of the COVID-19 pandemic shows that many sustainable development goals worldwide have consi taken considerable steps backwards. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability of established institutional solutions worldwide, such as underfunded healthcare systems, education systems that are not sufficiently prepared for digital solutions or insufficiently sustainable production and trading systems for essential goods. The system of cultural and creative industries, as well as tourism, are deeply threatened in their existence. While in Germany and Europe, a comprehensive bundle of support measures has so far largely preserved many social and economic sectors, the global situation in comparison is a wholesome tragedy. What do we need to do? The answer is clear. We need to stay committed to the 2030 Agenda and speed up its implementation. However, at the same time, we need to learn from the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic for implementing this 2030 Agenda. In my opinion, there are at least five important lessons. First, the concept of sustainability needs to better include the concept of resilience. That means the ability to be able to cope with shocks. In practical terms, for example, essential institutions such as the healthcare sector or the education sector need to be better equipped, staff needs to be better paid, financial contributions need to be more reliable and flexible at the same time. Production of essential goods and their supply chains may not be left entirely at the whims of global markets. Second, Sustainability requires overcoming traditional, clearly unsustainable solutions, for example, in mobility, production or the energy sector. And the COVID-19 pandemic is the ideal moment for this. It is time to build forward better. Third, we need to reaffirm that sustainability transformation needs social cohesion based on shared knowledge and experience solidarity and mutual trust from the local scale to the global scale. Social cohesion and trust have proven to be the most important factor in overcoming crises. That is something that we have learned from the pandemic. Much more action is needed now and in the future to strengthen cohesion and mutual trust within society. And this is connected to number four, Sustainability transformation requires that empirical knowledge and facts remain recognized as the basis for common understanding and decision-making in democratic societies. This requires the fight against lies, disinformation and conspiracy theories, both online and offline. Stories which are deliberately used to divide societies. And this is also concerns the further opening of science, of course, especially towards society, and it concerns the wider establishment of and adherence to good research practices. Fifth, sustainability transformations also require international openness, globally shared responsibility and cooperation rather than our country first approaches. Sustainability requires multilateral cooperation. What does this have to do with science? We all know that sustainability transformations require regulatory action by government, laws, incentive, taxes, etc. 
This has been known for a long time. We also know for a long time that sustainability requires education, both for wiser consumer choices and for the democratic legitimacy of regulatory action. And third, what we all have known for a long time is that sustainability requires innovation, new technologies and science. But what kind of science? That answer had been given by the UNESCO guidelines on sustainability science in research and education uh, published and adopted in the year 2017. The preamble had clearly laid out the requirements. Because sustainability challenges are wicked problems, that means that they, they are the, the result of interdependencies between societal, economic, environmental and cultural drivers that lead to the dynamic and mutual reinforcement with causes and effects at many geographic and temporal scales. They often seem intractable and are resistant to solution. Knowledge about their causes and interdependencies is often incomplete, contradictory and rapidly changing. Addressing one of these challenges can result in changing others for the worse. The global and local sustainability challenges imply many conflicts of goals and interests, which lead to policy dilemmas that require balance and compromise. And therefore, truly successful sustainability science addresses these wicked problems. It does not target individual sustainability challenges alone, but in exactly address the character of wicked problems to ensure the consideration of the interdependence of challenges, their complexity and mutual reinforcement, as well as different contexts, cultural differences and inherent conflicts of goals and interests. The UNESCO guidelines has exp have expressed six principles, such as the focus on solving problems, understanding dilemmas and conflicts of goals and interests, the need for the interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary cooperation, the high value of both academic freedom and academic responsibility. Through these UNESCO guidelines, we perfectly well know what kind of science is required. So what next? UNESCO has been pushing these insights contained in these guidelines ever since 2017. This concerns many of UNESCO's programs, both in the environmental and natural sciences and in the social sciences and humanities, for example, the UNESCO MOST program and its Bridges project. Sustainability science is also covered by principles of the 2017 revised UNESCO recommendation on science and scientific researchers. In addition, at present, UNESCO is working on the formulation of a global legal text, the recommendation on open science, to establish global definition standards and goals. And actually, this has a lot to do with sustainability science again. For example, in the understanding of UNESCO, transdisciplinary research is a form of opening to society and thus also a principle of open science. It refers to the co academic cooperation with non-academic stakeholders, whether they are responsibility bearers, decision makers, affected persons and multiplayers from companies, administration, politics and civil society. Principles of sustainability science such as co-design, co-creation, co-production of knowledge or co-dissemination are therefore also open science principles. And UNESCO, in UNESCO's understanding, open science is a key contributor to many SDGs and their targets. And I am convinced that the issues that I have mentioned initially that are important additions to the concept of sustainability, such as the increased importance of the concept of resilience, the importance of social cohesion and trust, will be thoroughly examined by the scientific community in years to come. And thus, the key postulate of this conference, Humanities and Social Science for Sustainability, is that these disciplines, the humanities and social sciences, are not only needed, but they are vital and irreplaceable to re realize truly successful sustainability transformations. I invite all of the participants of, to this conference, everybody who is watching or listening to these talks, to participate in this endeavor. The world has never 
needed scientists more than right now. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're watching this uh, video from. My name is John Crowley. I work for UNESCO's Sector for Social and Human Sciences. And as the program has shown you, I'm going to talk to you about energy systems from a social and human science perspective. Now, energy systems are not an obvious choice of topic for this discussion. I'm sure everyone would agree that they're important for every aspect of sustainability, transformation, and any other buzzword you care to choose. But important usually, at least as perceived, as a context rather than an object. The literature on energy systems is dominated for very good reasons by engineering and economics, because of course, it involves a lot of money and a lot of heavy infrastructure. And even the literature on energy policy is much thinner than one would expect in political science, in sociology, in history, in international relations, to say nothing of other disciplines like anthropology. So what would it mean to consider energy as an object for the social and human sciences? Interestingly, to find consideration of energy as more than just a background issue, there are two main paths, which indeed have significant overlaps. One is vitalist philosophy, as I will call it and define it in a moment. The other is systems theory. Now, by vitalist philosophy, I'm referring not to some specific technical branch of philosophy, not, for instance, to uh, anything in specific connection with the philosophy of uh, Bergson, but to any philosophy that considers organic processes as a philosophical object. An example of this is the way in which Bataille in La Part Maudite, um, on the basis, on the logic of excess in energy, Bataille argues that uh, life on Earth is defined by the sheer wastefulness of the energy received from the sun and lost and largely re-radiated re to space, but of course also informing the dynamics of every aspect of organic processes on Earth. And this is essentially a thermodynamic perspective. It's about the role of biocycles in the energy balance of the Earth as a whole, though of course Bataille doesn't put it in those terms which are more familiar to us now from, say, the uh, Earth systems literature. Life, in other words, is negentropic, a struggle against entropy, which of course wins in the end, but the end is a very long way away. In the meantime, life wins out by absorbing energy and transforming it into something else. And indeed, Deleuze and Guattari make very similar points in uh, A Thousand Plateaus on more or less the same grounds, taking it from um, the scientific literature of people like uh, uh, Kongian. This angle on individual units of energy transformation, to put it that way, uh, feeds naturally into systems theory. And indeed, the purely individualistic approach isn't compatible with what either Bataille or Deleuze and Guattari say. It's already some kind of a systems perspective, um, in which case the view of vitality as negentropic hybridizes very naturally with information theory. Take, for instance, the organic growth of a plant or an animal. It is necessarily, as we describe it through science, and also as we understand it even intuitively, as we understand it with respect to our own personal existence, an encounter between various forms of chemical energy and genetic information. The energy alone could not produce organized organic life, and the information alone would be powerless without the energy to actualize it. And this view, which is quite familiar from contemporary philosophy, extends seamlessly into the ways in which societies, as more abstract entities, not organic but connected in ways that are both analogous to organic systems and even have some very clear functional uh, correspondences with them, into the way in which societies organize themselves around the infrastructures of energy and information transmission and transformation, including, of course, the symbolic and imaginary organization. Now, I suspect everyone participating in this conference, everyone watching this video knows this at a certain level. We know, for instance, as an important issue in public debate, that the fossil fuel age is a total phenomenon, which includes, among other things, 
physical infrastructures, oil rigs, gas pipelines, transmission stations, and so on, power structures, including the power struggles around the control of the resources and of the physical infrastructures that transform them into usable uh, resources for human consumption, uh, the physical, financial, and symbolic flows that get resources from where they are in terms of production to where they need to be in terms of consumption. And there's a rich history of how the control of the various kinds of flows around energy has shaped and reshaped uh, political systems and even global geopolitics. The patterns of behavior by which, as consumers of energy and energy-related services, we come to acquire certain kinds of socially constructed identities. The motor car, the automobile, is a very good example of this, the way in which in very few decades it moved from being just a technology, a rather optional technology, one that when originally invented was probably much less efficient at doing what it was doing than more traditional modes of transport such as uh, horses, but which came not just to replace horses as they were traditionally used, not just to change patterns of use, but to change the whole structure of society around a particular mode of imaginary construction of speed and of distance and of convenience, which was fully completed in the 1940s in the US and not long after that in Europe, uh, largely in the 1960s, with the replacement of traditional forms of collective transport by uh, individual uh, automobiles and the consequential transformation, structural and imaginary, social and political of urban spaces in particular around this new arrangement of transport systems. So patterns of behavior that are intimately connected, of course, as we all know, uh, with the structures that make them possible and at the same time emerge from them. And finally, the imaginaries. I've just referred to the imaginary of the automobile. The imaginary of electricity available uh, at the touch of a button is also a social imaginary, not just a technological fact. Uh, we take it for granted in ways that, in the same way that, as everything else that we take for granted, shape our being and our identity. As an activist object, this is very well defined. Um, people um, uh, mobilizing around the end of the fossil fuel age, in the name in particular of climate resilience, are doing so with these sets of issues in mind. They know it's not just about changing infrastructures, it's about changing the power structures and the imaginaries that give meaning to those infrastructures. As an analytical object, on the other hand, I feel, wrongly perhaps, but it's my view of the literature certainly, uh, that it receives less attention than it deserves given its importance, which is not limited to contemporary issues about, say, climate change. And of course, this also means that our understanding of the transformations connected to the possible end of the fossil fuel age or its transformation into some new kind of hybrid uh, structure are themselves impoverished. It's very easy to sketch this as a neat, tidy triangle. I've done it myself in many talks. The triangle has three summits, infrastructures, institutions, behaviors. And the question is to get all three of them to change in a coordinated manner. But that's easy to say. It's much harder to do in practice. And one of the reasons why it's hard to do in practice is that the triangle only exists dynamically. What are the flows of energy and information that structure it? And how does the structure of those flows influence the conditions of possible transformation? That's obviously, again, a, a political challenge, an activist challenge, if you will, but it needs to be seen as well as a conceptual analytical challenge and also as a methodological challenge. How will we study these things? What are the appropriate ways of considering systems that can capture all of the features that make them exist as systems? Put it differently, any politics is negentropic by definition. Politics is a struggle against a certain form of entropy and the political organization of a community produces something through the confluence of energy and information that otherwise would not exist. It's a struggle to impose a certain kind of order, for better, for worse, including all the uh, pathologies of order, uh, the ideology of order, uh, to borrow the title of, a, of now a very old and classic book by, uh, by Preston King. But which negentropy? Simply to say that we are struggling against entropy in the name of some kind of negentropy is not to say 
anything about what might be desirable or feasible at that level. And of course, when I say we, I'm just using it as a verbal form, as we often do rather lazily. Nothing says that everyone could or should want the same thing. Now, as you can imagine, I'm not going to answer any of these questions. My time is up. This brief talk was just designed to excite some curiosity, I hope, around these topics, uh, at most to set a possible agenda. But what I am certain of is that serious engagement with Earth regeneration, which many of us would agree is necessary in the face of climate change and biodiversity loss, freshwater scarcity, plastic dissemination, and everything else that currently challenges us, demands serious intellectual engagement with energy by the social and human sciences. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you for this very, very interesting and stimulating and challenging uh, introductions. Uh, maybe the if there is one theme that apparently is coming is coming back is about humans versus nature and who has control over what. Uh, do we have ownership over nature or does nature have ownership over itself? Uh, as Lutz Muller was saying, you know, open side, the pleading for open science as if, if I share my knowledge, I lose it. <laughs> but I want to keep control over it again because, you know, it, it's a source of money. And that brings us to what John, John Crowley was saying, that the, the flows of energy and information in current society are mainly, uh, information is mainly expressed in, in terms of money. And so since we have extractive money, we will, we will see nature as, a, as an opponent, uh, a competitor, rather than as the web of life that we are a part of. So I would now like to open the floor to uh, reactions from uh, the people in the in the in the panel and we will also keep an eye open for uh, questions from the from the, the public in the youtube channel so the floor is yours yeah thanks if, if i might take uh, the word yeah i, I found this uh, i find these three uh, really uh, inspiring and interesting uh, presentations and i was but i'm particularly interested in the last aspect because that's something i've been i started to think about uh, too about uh, energy and the concept of energy right you the, the suggestion by john crowley was uh, to uh, make uh, turn energy into a, so, a social scientific object which i think is uh, and, and also a concept and i think this is actually very important but i wonder what exactly would the concept of energy energy be then? Because of course we have the physical concept in, in, in physics or in um, also in chemistry, right? Uh, and we can uh, say with this aspect, fossil energies or so, is an object for the social sciences. I think that would be relatively easy. But I wonder how we can connect it to things like a psychic energy or mental energy or political energy. I mean, because we could ask what we need or we could say what we need is uh, to master the political energy to uh, turn the world into a sustainable um, uh, thing or, uh, or sometimes it's about psychic energy when I find it quite interesting I think there's a correlation between the psychological problem of burnout which is a loss of energy which is certainly not physical energy it's somehow a, a loss of s psychic uh, motivational energy and uh, so the burning out from the inside and the burning up of the atmosphere in global warming I think they are somehow connected precisely on an energy level but it's true that in the social sciences we completely lack a corresponding uh, conception of energy so i wonder uh, whether you uh, whether you have any ideas of where we could go with this right uh, do, is there i mean randall collins suggested emotional energy which is some something shared it's something collective right created in institutions so maybe this uh, would be a route but i wonder whether uh, how you think that we can concept conceptualize energy uh, uh, in 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 a, in 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 a sense which is not just coming from the from physics To answer um, immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I, I think, um, first of all, you ask a very good question. And one of the traps we need to avoid here is the trap of being simply analogical. Mm. In other words, taking ideas that come from uh, one particular context of um, talking about energy, electricity, for instance, or 
um, oil or gas or whatever, and then assume that you can derive loose analogies from that and apply them to, um, to some other field. Uh, I think there are some big limits to that, and we need to be careful about it. Uh, I would like to, at the t same time, stick uh, quite closely to uh, physics, but also recognize that the notion of energy extends beyond what is usually studied uh, in physics. Um, and in that respect, perhaps one of the most useful connections is the connection between energy and work. Uh, which is the basis of uh, uh, the physical concept. Uh, energy is, at least in principle, energy that can produce work. Uh, though some forms of energy, such as uh, diffuse um, entropic energy, cannot. And uh, what I was referring to as negentropic processes are precisely processes that uh, use um, the work of energy to produce processes that create order out of the general entropic uh, tendency for order to decay. And in that respect, um, references to political or psychic energy or to the collective energy of action, um, the kind of thing um, Hannah Arendt talks about uh, when talking about the specific uh, notion of work in the sense uh, opera, uh, uh, opus, uh, the work of creation, yeah. is not um, simply an analogy of the physical processes. It is the same concept applied to a broader category of energetics, uh, which again connects energy, work, and order in a set of specific ways that can get inspiration and sometimes even modeling from uh, notions of thermodynamics. Uh, in the chat, uh, Carlos uh, pointed uh, in, in a very interesting way to the uh, chaos theory developed by uh, Ilya Prigozhin, uh, which is all about this. And we had a brief chat in the chat about uh, the book that Prigozhin and Stengers wrote uh, in the 1980s called Order Out of Chaos, which is about the way in which various kinds of dynamical systems, particularly dynamical systems of an organic nature, uh, can produce forms of order uh, from uh, chaotic models of physical interaction that one would expect to produce only disorder. And I think this is the kind of angle that needs to be followed, an angle that takes the science very seriously, an angle that takes the engineering basis of energy systems seriously and seeks to extend that understanding of um, the physics and the engineering to more social questions taking account of something that is absolutely central uh, in the work of Prigogine and Stengers, for instance, which is precisely the connection between energy and information. The energy information nexus being the condition for the organic ordering of potential chaos. Now, I know that's not answering your question, not nearly. It's not answering con it conceptually, and it's certainly not answering it methodologically. But it gives at least the spirit in which I believe uh, we uh, should be trying to work and where I think a lot of very interesting work uh, remains to be done, including in particular to try and imagine what a transition to a lower energy consumption society might look like. Uh, what would that actually mean to change our relation to energy from making it ultimately the core proxy of development? Energy consumption correlates very well with development in the material sense. It correlates very well also with human development. Um, Breaking that correlation raises some very serious conceptual and practical problems that I think constitute a research and action agenda that really deserves our attention. Sorry, that was long-winded and not very precise, but I hope it gives an idea of where I'm coming from and where I'd like to go to. Thank you very, very much, John, for clarifying that. Uh, any other people who want to? Yes, Lutz, can you unmute your microphone? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. I would just like to make a small remark on the contribution of Thilo Wesche in the beginning. Um, he pointed to the property rights of nature and, of course, uh, mentioned the famous case, I think, that everybody knows from of the river in New Zealand. But actually, it is not something that is completely foreign also to European um, traditions. 
not necessarily in the field of uh, nature, but there have been similar models, and I would like to mention one in particular. It concerns the World Heritage Site of the Cologne Cathedral, right in the city where I live. This actually, um, if you look in the regist property register, um, this cathedral belongs to itself. And all of the decisions are made on its behalf by a chapter of several hundred people that together try to fulfill the kind of tradition that was built um, in order uh, when in the 19th century the, the, the cathedral was finalized. So actually uh, to, to um, have a kind of a stewardship on behalf of a cultural object or a natural object, this is this can be found in Europe. It can be found in several practices also in dealing with certain um, um, natural resources, for for example, shared nat um, natural resources. Um, there are some areas of uh, Europe where certain forms of transhumans um, um, are used um, concerning um, shared property rights and, and uh, um, shared decisions on its behalf or uh, something from the south of Germany, the so-called Almentwiesen, the um, lawns that are um, mutually governed also with a certain respect, not really with a property right of nature itself, but this comes close to it. And I, I would finalize this list of possible examples. I think that there is a, a huge diversity also, not only in indigenous communities, but also in, in the in European, North American societies, of course, all across the globe, that, but that we tend to forget because it's a one, one narrative of, of property, one narrative of how the world is organized is, is uh, appears to be dominating everything that, that we are discussing about. Thank you very much. That indeed refers to also today the very the emergent landscape of you know the the commons and the sharing economy and where people are not treating nature as something uh, to use for for private ownership or private profit, but something that they govern together. Uh, I would like to know what other uh, people. Um, want to add to that? How does it how does it affect, for example, how we uh, how our, our science and research landscape is organized also around intellectual property, around the assumption that we can use nature as resources for uh, innovation and then bring it to the market. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, themes in there. You know, ownership is like a, 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 a connecting theme that relates to many other things that were said in the morning. So maybe, maybe Gary Jacobs would like to reflect on that. Thank you, Anne. I would actually like to go back to uh, what uh, John was just talking about, if I could, uh, because I thought he's touched on uh, his example of energy uh, and the integration of energy with all aspects of society really brings out something of the complexity we need to deal with when we're talking about social change. Because I mean, just for want of time, he touched on a few areas, the economic implications, the, uh, the technological implications, uh, the whole, after the automobile came to the US, the entire demography of the country changed. Uh, within 10 years, we changed from being a very urban to a suburban population. Our commerce changed. We ended up going uh, going to places by car, whether having to come to them uh, in the centralized place in a city. And I think it's very helpful when we're trying to look at uh, our adaptation to the challenges we face to now, now ecologically, to how deeply rooted the society is interconnected in every way with a present mode of not only energy, which is only an example, employment, for example, we see what happened with the COVID uh, 19, that suddenly the idea, it's only been the last 100 or 150 years that we've all been going to work somewhere else and then coming back. Uh, and we see how deeply entrenched uh, we are in particular ways of working. So I found his approach perspective very useful in looking more broadly at the problems of social change to see 
just how integrated every dimension of the society and every walk of life is with all the others. Thank you very much, Gary. Any other comments on that? Carlos, yes, go ahead. I wanted to come back to the point of um, these new approaches to ownership. Um, because let me be a bit provocative, right? This is the right context to be, I hope. And we hear a lot about uh, resilience. You know, the word uh, resilience has become now quite common in the global conversations, especially in the domain of those who are, who are uh, worried about sustainability and the future of humanity. And um, a provocative finding is that the most resilient societies, the most resilient human societies, are the indigenous ones. You know, they have been there for much longer than our uh, modern industrialized civilization. They have been there for thousands and thousands of years. And, um, and generally, with a conceptualization of, uh, of uh, ownership, you know, uh, either quite absent or at least very different from our own conceptualization of ownership. And in our own um, industrial civilization, where the concept of ownership, and in particular private ownership, is, let us say, central, um, we have these two-sided uh, nature, uh, taking the expression of Hartmut Rosa in the previous session of being powerful at the same time, powerless, uh, being extremely effective in, in transforming uh, many things around us in the material world, and at the same time being extremely effective in destroying the conditions under which human life can continue on Earth. You know? So basically committing suicide, being very effective in committing suicide through climate change, but also many other dimensions. And now we are trying to use one central concept of, uh, or extending one central concept of this self-defeating civilization in order to, to get out of this uh, dilemma we have uh, ourselves created. So I'm wondering if uh, we shouldn't look at how indigenous civilizations have been dealing with this concept of ownership and, and, and common goods and, and so on, you know, what we call modernly common goods, um, rather than trying to extending a little bit like, you know, too far away, um, our own uh, concept of, uh, of ownership. So this is my, my provocation. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think it, it uh, resonates quite well with what uh, was said in the morning by Mampila also, that we yep. can learn a lot from, from indigenous wisdom. And it struck me when I, when I heard the, the story by Tito Vesha that apparently we, we need the detour of, um, of ownership, you know, giving, own, giving nature the right to ownership to sort of like respect, <laughs> respect nature again. You know, we, we, we need to, to put nature in, uh, see nature as a competitor and then say, well, the competitor has the same rights as us uh, before we can let go or limit our own uh, claims to nature rather than... We, we, which, is, which is in a way, so, sorry to interrupt, but which is in a way connected to this idea of the efficiency of, the, of, the, of our economic uh, processes and efficiency of the markets, which I think is a completely, this is the biggest fake news that we, that we deal with, you know. We have been using this concept for decades and, almost, and generations. While I, what definition of efficiency could you imagine to use for processes which are so effective in destroying the conditions for our, for our own survival? 
You know, you cannot use any, any I, there is no way to use efficiency to describe that. I wonder if John Crowley would like to say something about it because this efficiency uh, logic is also related to the to the the hope of in, you know increasing negentropy or you know, keeping the order stopping the order from from destroying all life. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are some very interesting connections uh, uh, between what Carlos just said, uh, some of the things I was saying. If that doesn't sound too um, narcissistic. And some of the things that uh, Hartmut Rosa was saying earlier, um, the um, the idea of control um, clashes with a much more traditional idea of excess. Um, the idea of efficiency clashes with the symbolic organization of inefficiency, which is characteristic of many traditional cultures. And this is Bataille's point uh, in the passage I was referring to at a very abstract philosophical level, but still making some interesting points about the energy balance of the earth, because he was not unaware of the science of what he was referring to. Uh, the fact that um, in traditional civilizations, at the risk of, of caricature, I know, and not all traditional civilizations live uh, in contexts of abundance, but still, um, one of the most important features of both the cosmology and the cultural practices uh, is uh, the symbolic organization of waste. Doing things that serve no instrumental purpose, destroying things of great value, and doing so because that says something very important about how you relate to yourself as a group and to the cosmos as a setting within which that group uh, lives its existence. The idea of very carefully husbanding resources, as the phrase goes, is an idea that is not universally human. It corresponds to specific social and cultural forms, which have been extensively studied, and the kind of reductio ad absurdum, ad absurdum of that is the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Um, the way in which Weber shows um, of course, this has been challenged by many who've shown, among other things, that capitalism actually emerged um, in Catholic Italy before it did uh, in Lutheran Germany. I'm ignoring those um, uh, issues uh, and just commenting on the way in which Weber himself uh, formulates the idea that you can't have a capitalist economy without an ideology of abstinence, self-sacrifice, and uh, avoidance of waste. And this is connected to many other movements in modernity. Let me just mention another one at the risk of just sort of uh, surfing on all sorts of references. Um, the famous um, pages in which uh, Michel Foucault uh, describes um, uh, criminal punishment in uh, pre-revolutionary France uh, are on his own interpretation, which I think is a perfectly valid interpretation, a demonstration of excess. And he interprets this as the sheer baroque absurdity of punishment, the seven pages account, con contemporaneous account of a public execution in 1757 uh, that he puts at the beginning of uh, surveiller et punir, of discipline and punish, is a demonstration of the fact that a state that controls nothing needs to show spectacularly that at least it can destroy a body tear it apart, cut it in pieces, burn it, torture it. Um, if we can't control, we will at least do something. And in that respect, I, I think there's a lot to be got from, um, first of all, getting out of a purely celebratory perspective on indigenous knowledge, useful though that may be in certain uh, contexts, getting out of a simple binary opposition between the traditional and the modern, or between the indigenous and the civilized or whatever, there are a million reasons why we should uh, be exiting from that kind of mindset. And um, using this perspective on waste, excess, and spectacle as contrasted with um, accumulation, efficiency, and careful husbandry, um, and looking at the tensions between the two dynamics that exist in our own society as well. We, we have not completely exited that symbolic world of spectacular excess, but we channeled it into different areas. We've restricted it to certain parts 
of our moral and symbolic and also financial economy. Uh, we have isolated a specific class of people whose function it is to demonstrate ostentatious waste for us so that the rest of us can get on with efficiency. Not completely different from the way the Aztecs or the Mayas or traditional African uh, empires did it, but very different at the same time. Not completely, but significantly different. Again, I'm, I'm throwing far too many words into something that lacks concision and precision, but you see where it would be interesting to go with this. How do we manage excess, both materially and symbolically, and what does it say about us? That would be the short headline version. Well, thank you very much for that. It is very uh, unfortunate that Thilo Vesh could not uh, join us for the for the discussion, for the debate. He had to leave for uh, unforeseen, uh, due to our unforeseen circumstances. Because what John just said is is like a very total, a totally different approach to how we relate to nature than than the the you know the ownership as the primary category, and then you know re repairing our our destructive relationship with nature by giving nature ownership over itself, which seems like a, a yeah somehow an anthropomorphic detour that that we could that we should probably also could skip by not not starting from ownership but but from access as you say. So maybe Lutz, would you like to uh, react to that or see how that relates also maybe to to how we deal even with with knowledge and with education and with science? You know, the the, the science of of nature is also privatized and um, which keeps us from you know reconnecting with with each other and with nature. Well, I was about to make a sh short comment about what John just just said before. I mean, and I'm, I, 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 I completely agree with this, uh, the importance of the symbolic des description also of a, something like an energy system, because something that um, I find found always extremely interesting when observing the last 20 years or 30 years of the energy transformation, energy system transformation that was happening and is still happening here in Germany, to what extent it is really driven by narratives. Narratives of, of, in the very beginning about what is possible and what is not possible. So that the, the, the initiators of renewable energies were just it, it decried as phantasts, which are not to be taken serious. Uh, but that is not the important part. I think an important part in the in the 90s, early 2000s, the, um, that drove the energy uh, transformation, the early energy transformation in Germany was the connection of energy to um, decentralization, energy autonomy, and in order to empower people and empower communities. So this kind of uh, liberating narrative was very strongly behind the, the, the initial um, trends. Then, of course, we had the um, 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 regulation and government support incentive programs. So that uh, the, 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 the power of that narrative was lost. But then also the, the, the energy transformation lost steam because it lost steam, one of its most important drivers, I think, nowadays. Uh, um, our government supports very much the big um, players from the fossil fuel, um, fossil fuel um, industry again to support the transformation. And of course, they do it in the old kind of way. And we feel a lot of resistance in rural parts of Germany because the kind of narrative is gone. And so it is, I, I, I like very much this, the, the, the references to power struggles that John made and all the, the symbolic dimension of these processes. I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, Hartmut want to say something? What? Yeah, I, I mean, to, uh, to the access uh, dimension and uh, John, uh, John Crowley's uh, observation, I think, I mean, there's a very interesting aspect in the way we live where, where you can see this, uh, which uh, we can derive from Karl Marx. I mean, you know, Marx said the interesting thing about capitalism, capitalist production, is that the, the, the moral consumption is faster than the physical consumption. The, the idea was that we throw out the machines with which we produce textiles, for example, at a pace which is uh, higher than, I mean, when, when they are still 
still good. We could still use them, but they are no longer uh, productive enough. And this is something we now do with kind of everything. Right? We throw away our uh, smartphones, even though they still work. We throw away the computers, even though they still work. We, st we even throw away our clothes, even so they are still good, but they are out of fashion. And actually it's true, and we sh throw away our uh, furniture at home, right? The kitchen and the bed and everything basically, right? Is, is kind of made anew, even though it's still materially good. So that has a lot to do with the energy transfer, I would say. And this is a kind of excess dimension because the moral consumption is faster than the physical consumption. So, so maybe we can think along those lines. Tiago? Yes, I would even add uh, some uh, interesting experience I had here in this, in this former uh, GDR. People throwing away burger uh, ceramics. So all these objects the old, that were yeah. main, uh, uh, typical, iconographical for for this GDR, they, they are throwing away, and and we are collecting. I like them very yeah. much. People are offering for free, you know. But just uh, just two remarks uh, to to point what Carlos and also uh, Mr. Müller has said about the property of indigenous, uh, uh, this, this concept. In many cases, it's not the property over nature, but it is the technology of using uh, these, uh, these natural resources. The case of the, of the South African musical bow, I had an experience in a meeting there that uh, a participant came and, and told me, you are not allowed to, to play our our musical bow using, of course, not saying using these overtones, but using our, our this technology because it's our property. And another important thing is the notion of property is not individual, it's always, always uh, community based. This is another difference from, from copyright law uh, here in the, the Western. And the last thing I would like to add is if we speak about nature, and uh, also uh, living heritage uh, in respect to that, the animal rights. This is a new topic coming up and I'm dealing with this. Uh, so uh, animals and cultural heritage, who, uh, who owns this animal? And this is another thing which we can find among indigenous people the respect for the animal as another entity, not different or not less valuable than me as a human being. This is another very interesting topic to be discussed. Okay, uh, and can I? Pass the word to you because here I have no visual contact with the Yeah, that's industry. it. That's try, try to. Yeah, um, you, you I would like I would like to use the opportunity to have John and um, uh, Lutz Müller together on the on the panel in respect of the last session we will have uh, the roundtable, the discussion of implementation of all the topics we were uh, addressing here and bringing up as potential fields and potential contributions of the humanities and social sciences to sustainability policies. I mean, we were discussing uh, topics that would be um, real important contribution of the humanities and social sciences to the sustainability policies. But looking at the funding systems, uh, I addressed that already uh, once this, uh, today, uh, sustainability is under control very much of the natural sciences, especially of the bio-geo section of the natural sciences. And also, yeah, uh, and and if you come up with a proposition in funding systems for sustainability issues, you are confronted with uh, this hardlining, hardliner uh, funding ideas. If it doesn't fit in their disciplinary grid, you are out of, of, of competition somehow. So how could, what could UNESCO do, for instance, to, to have an impact on the funding, on the national funding systems and funding logics that researchers and engaged people from all different disciplines, not only from the natural sciences, could engage in the fulfillment of the agenda that the UN and, and, and UNESCO are setting. I mean, 
very often on the national level, funding systems are in complete contradiction to the, to the political agenda of UNESCO. I, yes, you're right, Ben, although I think the, contra the contradiction uh, also runs through uh, the agenda itself. Um, the, and this will be an occasion to come back to a, a comment on some of the things that were said earlier. Um, the 2030 agenda, as it's designed institutionally, is a technocratic, top-down agenda with um, a hierarchy of goals, targets, and indicators, uh, which is supposed to be rolled out. At the same time, the implementation architecture in the real world uh, is incompatible with that vision of the project. And a lot of the difficulties uh, since its adoption, uh, even more than the MDGs, the big difference with the Millennium Agenda was that the Millennium Agenda was limited and focused. It had only eight goals, uh, it didn't claim to deal with everything. It claimed to be an expression of prioritized concern by the international community. And the idea that when you have prioritized consensual concerns, you can then define a top-down solution, roll it out for limited priority goals, that's not ridiculous. It might or might not be the best way of doing it, but it's not self-contradictory. The SDGs claim to capture everything. And unsurprisingly, you can't capture everything in a top-down technocratic framework. And we know that as an inst internal planning problem, uh, even within UNESCO. Uh, and it's true in every part of the UN system. The fact that we have contradictory requirements with respect to an agenda that is supposedly already sealed as a set of objectives, again, uh, goals, targets, indicators, once and for all, by diplomatic negotiation, and at the same time needs to be owned by everyone concerned with it. And just see it from the perspective of local communities, cities, trades unions, political parties, youth groups, uh, consumer organizations, indigenous peoples, um, and many other non-state components within, within the international system, which are not your traditional international NGOs, they would say, why would we simply join this particular party when first we had no opportunity to shape that agenda? And secondly, um, it would need to be contextualized in a way that would actually call it into question. But we're not allowed to do that. We're supposed simply to implement it. And that's basically what the social debate is. And in that respect, at the risk of um, going a bit off message and probably sounding very institutionally incorrect, I'm not sure the pandemic shakeup isn't a good opportunity to get rid of some of that baggage. Um, we, there have been a number of occasions in the past 20 years where the international system has fallen into the trap of adopting these technocratic top-down solutions with no capacity to deliver them. And probably it wouldn't have been desirable anyway to have that capacity. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol was probably the first example. The Millennium Agenda followed, and the SDGs were an extension of that. Um, I'd just like to plug um, the late Steve Rayner's book on the Kyoto Protocol. Um, he called it The Wrong Trousers. I don't know if you've read the book. It was co-authored, but I can't remember who he co-authored it with. Um, if you know your cinema, you know that The Wrong Trousers is a Wallace and Gromit film. It's about literally the wrong trousers. Um, but Rayner's point was that... Um, the Kyoto Protocol was imagined on the back of the success of the Montreal Protocol to deal with chlorofluorocarbons, which succeeded, and uh, to a considerable extent also on the back of um, sulfur dioxide um, abatement policies uh, earlier in the 1980s, which also succeeded to a considerable extent through techniques that were appropriate for those particular kinds of issues, given real technological substitutability. Um, for a whole series of reasons, that didn't apply to climate change. And as a result, the world lost basically 15 years trying uh, to implement the Kyoto Protocol before realizing it had to do something different. Maybe the pandemic is a wake-up call with respect to um, uh, the SDGs of the same magnitude and significance as um, COP15 was for the International Climate Change Agenda. Maybe. 
Um, of course, that kind of shake-up isn't always good news because you can lose a lot of valuable stuff when you shake the tree that hard. But at the same time, the agenda as it is is not going in the right direction. Again, I'm not trying to be at all uh, politically correct here. And just to comment on the previous discussion, I think one of the key words here is commensurability um, as a concept and as a set of technologies. Um, I, I really thank Hartmut for his points about routine excess and waste. Uh, I, I got dragged in my improvised comment earlier into the direction of emphasizing the ostentatious parts of excess in our society compared to other societies. But it's absolutely true that um, our economic systems are built on routine excess, of which planned obsolescence is just one of the most spectacular uh, manifestations. And one of the um, challenges we face, and this goes back to the question of whether it makes sense to give rights to nature in the traditional sense of the word rights, is that we're trapped within those ideas of commensurability. If certain things have value, then they must have value on the same scale. And we must be able to trade off those values in uh, reasonable, appropriate, prudent ways. What if things are not commensurable? Mm -hmm. And traditional ideas of excess were all about incommensurability. And this is why, and this is obviously extensively documented, why the uh, Spanish invaders um, encountered um, uh, populations, Aztec, uh, later um, uh, Inca, who literally did not understand a value system in which gold was comparable to other things. The whole point of gold for the um, pre-Columbian civilizations was its incommensurability. Once you make it commensurable, you change the world. Mm -hmm. In this case, very destructively. How do we build incommensurability back in? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I will be uh, very shortly in, into the question of Ben Valen. Um, shortly, uh, but I have to reply to uh, John before. I, I, I don't want to be politically correct here, but I, in contrast to you, I see a lot of um, um, processes that preceded the 2030 agenda in 2014, 2013, where indigenous groups, women groups, youth were fully engaged. So there were, there were participation processes. And I think the, the, the way since 2015 has not been as negative as you have judged it. I judge it differently here. I think um, in, in our country, um, a lot of um, um, momentum has been generated at a lot of different levels. There are many partners all across our countries who take this agenda very seriously. So that's not, it's at the level of cities, at, at the level of the states, at the level of the government. So there is a lot of momentum. It is translated into concrete action also by by different actors, um, you see most of the um, companies in the DAX, uh, the German uh, um, um, uh, in, um, fund, uh, corporate uh, index, stock exchange, yeah, they um, who are organizing their principles around uh, the agenda 2030, and that improves the quality of their sustainability agendas, even if you can still be very critical. So I'm not that critical as you are. But now coming back to the question of Ben Valen, um, yes, indeed, currently also in our country, when uh, science funding is discussed, it's mostly about the geosciences because they have got chips, they have got the, the big infrastructures, so there's where a lot of money goes, um, the uh, funding to interesting social and science and humanities research also in our country is completely ne negligible in, in comparison. How can we change that? Um, we have worked um, through working uh, on the basis of the sustainability science guidelines of 2007. We tried to work with the big players in the German research si uh, system. There has been some progress, insufficient. We will not stop. It's an uphill battle, which is going to be continued for at least another five years. But I see very promising signs there as well. Thank you. Uh, ben, I don't know if you want 
to say a last word, but I think we need to close the session here. But right. I'll let Benno close the session, maybe. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, yes, we are close the session on time, or nearly on time. Uh, I will just uh, draw the attention to tomorrow's program. We will start at 9.30 uh, a.m. CET2 uh, about the knowledge mobilization. And there we will have a focus on the strategy of uh, the, South, um, the International Council for Philosophy and the Human Sciences, but also from people working in the mobilization of knowledge, including also uh, educational system and how we can um, diffuse or generate new knowledge. And uh, the last session will be in the morning about uh, arts and sustainability. And in the afternoon, we will go closer to the implementation of all that we have been discussed. We'll have, first of all, the presentation of uh, Ursula Gobel from um, the Canadian Council of uh, Social Sciences and Humanities on their project. And after that, uh, Joan Kaufman and I will present uh, some results of the German contribution to that and Paul Srivastava uh, from uh, the US and former um, CEO of uh, Future Earth will talk about uh, sustainability transformation at universities and we will conclude the, the whole conference with the roundtable discussion, hopefully with as many people that have attended today the conference to discuss the implementation of all the ideas we generate today and will generate tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody uh, from the Zoom community, from the viewers uh, uh, that we didn't see or hear, and to all the participants uh, here on the studio. Thank you very much and looking forward to, to meeting you tomorrow again. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.